Hello and welcome to E-Rate, what's new for 2017. I am Krista Porter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, I am officially, my title is Library Development Consultant, which is um, a nice vague catch-all title. Just means I do a bunch of things in a library development department here at the Nebraska Library Commission. One of those things is I am the state E-Rate consultant, um, state E-Rate coordinator for uh, public libraries in uh, Nebraska. So I am the person here on, on staff who is available to for training, to um, any consultation you need on doing your E-rate, um, any questions, help, things you don't understand, that's my job, that's what I'm here for, uh, for our public libraries in the state. Uh, this um, during today's webinar, we are going to uh, learn about E-Rate for the upcoming year. Uh, what things are new for 2017? There's some things, lots of things are very similar from last year, and from the most recent couple of years, um, some things are new uh, here and there. More of an advancement of things that you already were into uh, from the previous year. Uh, but we're going to start with the very basics of this of the program for anyone who is brand new to doing E-Rate, and just as a refresher for those of you who have been doing it for years and years and years, uh, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of a refresher of, of what exactly it's all about. So let's jump right in. We got about two hours ish of uh, information to go through, maybe a little longer, depends on how quickly I get through things and how many questions you guys have. So what is E-Rate? E-Rate is a federal program that gives discounts to um, public libraries and schools in, in the U.S. for the on the cost of your phone and your internet costs. This is anything internet related, uh, the monthly bills, any construction you need done, wiring cables, um, same thing for telephone, if you need lines run, all of those kind of things, anything telecommunications and internet related. Uh, the money for this program, and it gives you a discount on your bills that you get. This isn't a loan program or a grant program, it's just an outright discount on how much you're paying. Uh, the money for this program comes from the universal service fee, this is one of those many taxes and fees that you pay on your bills, your phone bills and your internet bills. If you look at them, you'll see um, somewhere in there there will be something that actually says universal service. Uh, sometimes it's abbreviated USF. Um, but everybody, um, both us as users and your telecommunication providers, your services, uh, put money into this pot that is then um, divided up among schools and libraries in, uh, the, to give them a discount. The FCC runs the program. They're the ones in charge. They put out the rules. They tell you um, what you're supposed to do. And when the program was first uh, created, which was um, created from the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was when this was uh, dictated that this needed to be done. Uh, the Universal Service Administrative Company, USAC, was created to run the program. Uh, this, there's the program that is for schools and libraries, which is the schools and libraries division, which is for our public schools, um, our, our sco uh, K through 12 schools and our public libraries. There's also three other programs that they also run. There's a uh, one for healthcare providers and healthcare facilities, so they can get a discount on the same kind of services. And there's one for high cost areas. There's certain areas of the country where things are way more expensive. And there's one for a uh, more low income, a lifeline type program. Um, we are uh, we deal with the schools and libraries division of USAC who helps us. Uh, I usually talk about um, the e rate people as USAC, however, because that's who whenever you will be emailed or when you will get uh, something in the mail, which doesn't happen too much anymore. But anytime they contact you, that's who they talk about them. So they say we are from from USAC. So that is how I will talk about them uh, throughout the whole presentation and whenever I talk to you guys about things. So as I said, the FCC sets the rules. Uh, every uh, The program has been in effect, as I said, from the Telecommunications Act of 1996. The first year you could apply was in 97, and then the first time people got monies was in 1998. So that would have been the first time anybody um, had money from this. Over the years, they've updated the rules and regulations five or six times, I believe I think the sixth report was the last one before this modernization one in 2014. So not every year do things change majorly, but um, whenever something does need to be updated, they do do something about it. They do pay attention. The big one, though, that did come up was this modernization report and order in 2014, and that's what changed a lot. This was a order to streamline, make things easier, make things simpler, uh, make things online 
completely. So that's part of modernization. So there's no paper forms and things you're dealing with. Uh, it's been a hit or miss on how successful some of this has been done, but it's a work in progress. And we're, we're going to go through all those things throughout the presentation. Anything that is a as a result of this modernization order is in green text. I've tried to do that throughout the whole presentation. So you'll know things that are just the basics of what the program's always been as compared to what are the new things um, that are brand new since that 2014 order. So the FCC puts out these orders saying, here's how we want things done. And then USAC has to figure out, OK, now how do we actually take that and make it happen um, with updating our forms, creating new websites, doing whatever they need to do. So who can apply for E-rate? Uh, libraries and library systems um, in Nebraska, all public libraries are eligible to be to apply for E-rate. There is no, um, you don't have to be accredited in a special way. Um, the only thing is being, the only requirement, and this comes from E-rate, is being eligible for LSTA funding. Uh, and this comes down through the Library Commission, actually, because we use LSTA funding to provide certain services to all public libraries in the state, you are then considered eligible for those funds as well because you benefit from something we're doing using those funds. So all public libraries, uh, schools and school districts as well, and if we had consortiums, groups of schools, groups of libraries getting together, um, that would be something as well. Um, as I said in the beginning, I handle public libraries in the state, so I, I'm in charge of just helping the libraries. For the schools and school districts, just so you guys know, there is the Nebraska Department of Education handles um, support and training for all of them. So they have a particular people on staff there that help all the schools. So for this session, of course, and for all of you guys who are at public libraries, we're all going. This is all going to be public library related. Pretty much everything they do is very similar to what we do. It's all the same forms, but they do have some of their own little uh, ways of having to deal with things and, and, and interpret the rules. So um, the Department of Education helps them out with that. So I don't have to figure out how to um, help them. So. Before you get into doing E-Rate, and I know many of you already have been doing it for years, but uh, the first thing I always tell new libraries is figure out how much of a discount you can get. Calculate what your discount is going to be. See if it's going to be worthwhile for you to go through and participate in this program. E-Rate is an ongoing program. Uh, there are forms you fill out throughout the year at certain times of the year. So it is something you have to keep up on and pay attention to and keep up with the deadlines. Um, every year when you do it, it's not something you can apply for once and you keep getting it. It is a thing that is um, each year you have to redo it. So you want to see if it's worth your while. So to calculate your discount, libraries, what you can get is a discount is anywhere from 20 to 90 percent off of your telephone and internet related costs. Most libraries in Nebraska fall in the 60, 70, 80 percent area. So um, pretty good. Uh, definitely worth it, I, I would think, depending on you know how much time you have to go through all of these, the the process. To figure out what your discount is, it is based off of the um, National School Lunch Program. That's the free and reduced lunches that the children get in schools. Uh, the FCC, USAC, decided they needed some way of determining what areas of the country, how much different areas should get. And they wanted some way of figuring out where are the most needy areas. And they decided to, there's many ways to determine who's needier, where's their higher poverty levels, things like that. They decided this is a good indicator of um, higher poverty levels. If there's more children who are eligible for the school lunch program, the free and reduced school lunch program, that's a needier area in the country most likely. We'll give them a slightly a higher discount on their bills than people, areas that have less. So that is um, where that comes from. The it is specifically the school district in which the library building is physically located. Now, you may serve, uh, have students and people that come into your library that are from other school districts that are around you, and that's fine. However, to calculate your discount, you look geographically in which school district does the library building physically sit, and those are the, lunch, the numbers that you look at to calculate your discount. Um, in addition, you can't include any pre-K kids. That's just a, a restriction they put on it. Um, so it only would be kindergarten through 12th grade numbers. Um, in addition to that, you combine that with the fact of whether you are urban or rural. And this is um, just comes from the U.S. Census. So to get these numbers, luckily for us, the Department of Education puts, posts these every year. 
uh, there is now there's a long link there don't try and scribble these down you do have the power of this presentation all of these links also are available on my e-rate website that I have that you can go and look at and just click off to it uh, but luckily for us the Department of Education here in Nebraska every year posts the uh, the lunch numbers so you can go there they have a spreadsheet that lists every individual school but there's also a separate tab that is the school districts all um, calculated up together which is great uh, it tells you how many kids are, are L enrolled in the school district, how many are eligible for the school lunch program, and then what that percentage is, because that's what you need is the percentage to do your E-rate calculation. And something that's key to this is it's not how many, how many children actually apply, it's how many are eligible. Not every family decides to participate in the program, uh, so that would be a lower number potentially. So this is how many could, could possibly participate is what this is all about. Uh, in addition to that, then you see if your urban or rural status is, USAC on their website has a, to a place where you can look up your county and city and see, and this is just based on the most recent, well, let me should, 2010 census data is what they've based it on. Uh, you take those two numbers and you use USAC's discount matrix, which is on the next page screen here, to figure out what your discount will be. Now, you'll see here there is Category 1 and Category 2, and that's the different types of services that you can get an E-rate discount on, and I'm going to explain all of that, what the difference is, so that'll be coming. But you can see here, the higher percentage of students eligible, the higher discount you get. And if you are rural, it also is, a first up for some levels, it is a higher discount as well. So they give their, the rural areas a little, a little bump. So you can see here, even if you have only 50, up to 49%, a little less than 50% of the of the children in your area are eligible, you can get anywhere from 60 to 70% off on your um, costs. Pretty good deal. Uh, we only have a few libraries I've seen in the state that do uh, get up to 90%. I don't think I've seen anybody go below 40 in Nebraska. I'd have to double check. So it's it's a pretty uh, definitely good thing to do. So See, do this calculation yourself. See if you can, if it is worth it to you, your school, or your library, your administrators, to go through the effort of keeping up with this program, the E-rate program, and keeping up with the um, forms um, to see if you, you know, is a 50% discount worth it? Is 60%? You know, up to you. <clears throat> now the. Uh, E-rate funding year runs officially from July 1st of every year to June 30th of the next year. The funding year is the amount of time that you're applying for to get a discount on. So whenever you are applying for E-rate, you're actually thinking to the future, thinking what um, I want to get my, a discount on what I've been what I pay for my bills, but right now, in, in the fall of 2016, we are looking to apply for discounts that will start being reflected on our bills in July of next year. It's not the kind of thing where you're looking at, um, I just paid a bill and I want to get a refund on it. It doesn't work that way for the current bills. You would have applied last year for the current months. So you're always looking to the future when you're thinking about E-rate. So right now, you can actually start the process, and I'm going to be showing you how to go through the, the steps to do that for funding that you will start receiving in July. Sorry, I just need to grab this here, of next year. All right. There's about $3.9 billion is available. That's how much money is in the program at the moment. Um, they do adjust it if necessary for inflation, so that could vary of how much is available. Um, category 1 and Category 2 funds are uh, given out slightly differently, and I'm going to get to a lot of details of that. Um, your Category 1 is usually your basic monthly phone and internet bills, just the usual thing you pay for each month. Category 2 is generally everything extra, uh, construction, wiring, cabling, um, anything you need to get those um, services to the computers. They look at the at Category 1 applications first, fund them, and then if there's still money left, they go on to Category 2. So there's quite a big chunk of money that we're putting into here that is available. So what can you get E-rate discount on? Every year, uh, what is E-rateable? I'm not sure if that's a word, but uh, every year the FCC publishes what they call their eligible services list. This is a list of all the services, programs, equipment, everything that you can get an E-rate discount on. Um, they post it every year on their website, and there's a link to it. I do have a link off our website for that as well. And they actually have all the previous years as well. So always make sure you're looking at the 
list for the upcoming year to see what is eligible for you because they do change this list. They will add new services, um, add new um, things that have come up that they've learned about. New, if people have asked, well, what about this kind of a piece of equipment? What about this service? They will, you know, adjust the list appropriately. And if you're looking to apply for 2017, starting in July of next year, you need to use the 2017 list to see what you're eligible for. Potentially something on the 2016 list um, might not be eligible anymore or something new wasn't on that one and is on the new one. So always look at the most recent one. Uh, the eligible services list has been modified um, a huge amount over the years and um, a big change is made, as you can see here, based on the new, that new modernization order. Um, up until 2014, when that order was put out, it was at least 50 pages long. I did 49 pages officially that year and it varied depending on how big the appendix was and whatever other things they're adding to it. It was huge. It was unwieldy. It was hard to search through and find what is, is eligible, what isn't. Over the years, they had put not just what is eligible, but every time, a lot, many times when people were asking, well, what about this? What about that? They had all sorts of explanations about what things weren't eligible. So there was in, things that are not eligible for e rate in there. It was just ridiculous. So they said, as far as this order, you need to streamline it, cut it down, make it easier for people to read through and figure out what can and can't I get a discount on. And they did in 2016, it went down to eight pages long. And that's what it is for the current year as well. Much easier to look through and read and figure out is it or isn't. Pretty much what they've done is they've taken out all those extra things of you know, this special case and that special case. And, and it, yes, all these are the, here's the three pages, what's not eligible. And they've just said, this is what's eligible. And that's it. Don't ask, you know, you can ask about details and things, but we're not going to put it in this list because that's just getting crazy for people to have to deal with it. Um, as I said, it is divided into Category 1 and Category 2 services. And the basic way you can think about them is um, they are split up by the walls of your building. Category 1 is getting the services connectivity to your building. Uh, the actual, as I said, the monthly internet cost, the monthly phone bill, um, some minor construction that might be needed to get that connection, certain special constructions to get those connections to the building. Category two is once you've got that service, then how do you get it out to all the different computers and workstations in the building? Um, the wiring, the servers, the networking, all of that related stuff, that falls, falls generally into your category two, is those types of things. Another a big change that was made in the eligible services list is focusing on um, internet specifically, Wi-Fi, broadband, any ways of getting internet. Uh, the FCC had looked into what's going on out in the world and noticed, as many of us do, that internet across the country in many areas is not fast enough, it is not strong enough as it should be. They want, it, it needs to be better. And we all know there's lots of ways things going on to try and increase the broadband um, across the country. For FCC, the FCC, for E-rate purposes, is they want to do that as well, and they want to focus on only providing services to that, uh, providing discounts to that. So a part and a way to do that is phasing out support, actually, for the telephone services. So I have been mentioning that both internet and phone is available. Gradually, though, voice services, your telephone is not going to be um, part of the program anymore. And it has been since 2015, gradually being phased out. Um, each year, they just um, provide a little less support for it and until there's no support at all. And I've got some details about exactly how that works. Um, it, it has been a point of controversy, however. Uh, many large school districts, large library systems had put, when, when the FCC first suggested this, they did put um, responses back to them saying, this is not good, um, this telephone is an essential service for us, we need to have the support, the, the discounts for it. Um, this is going to be a hardship on many schools and libraries if they cannot get that discount still on their telephone. And the FCC took that, you know, listened and said, sorry though, but we We've decided to change the focus of E-Rate to Internet. And looks like they're not going to back off on that. So this is something you do have to think about with E-Rate, that if you have been getting a lot of telephone support, it's gone, it's already been going away and it's going to be gone completely by 2019. Um, if you're getting internet, that's fine, that's good. You still have the internet, that's not changing at all. That's where they're focusing on. Um, if you're only doing telephone, you might wanna start looking into applying for internet discount through E-Rate to help make up for that. I believe that's part of what E-Rate was hoping libraries and um, applicants would do. 
Um, however, I do know here in Nebraska, and I'm, and I'm sure in many other rural type areas, we have lots of service providers that are that provide internet access to our public libraries either for free or at a really good discount as a uh, public service to the community. So applying for an e-rate discount on a bill that you don't even pay is kind of a moot point. So just something to be aware of. However, in the, you know that's the bad side of it that we're losing it. And the good side is it worked. They had enough money in the last two years to fund all applications. As I said before, um, they fund uh, the is it category one applications first, and then if there's money left over, still money, they go to category two. Up until 2015, there was always announcements every year that, okay, category one is done, and now we're only going to fund the category two up to the 80% discount, meaning only libraries that have 80 or 90% discounts on their category two services would receive any funding. Meaning if you fell into the 60, 50, 40, you were just out of luck. That was just how they had to do it because they did not have enough money to go around to do everything, but they figured we'll give it to the neediest areas. By phasing out the phone service, they were able to fund every single application. That was, that was submitted correctly, of course. So it's working. It is hard that a lot of us are losing the telephone support, but what, you, what the FCC wanted to do in supporting broadband and internet and Wi-Fi and getting that more money to help libraries do that, it worked. So just keep that all in mind. Here is what is eligible for Category 1. Uh, basically, any way of getting internet, broadband, Wi-Fi to your library is eligible. This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just an example of some of the things. Uh, you can look and see in the eligible services list more details. So if you have cable modem, DSL, uh, fiber, lit and dark, satellite service, T1 lines, any way that you get the internet to your library, you can get a discount on that connection, on that service. Uh, fiber, lit and dark fiber has been a little bit confusing to some people of what is the difference and what is it. When fiber lines are laid, have been laid over the years, when they dig the trenches and put the lines in, they put in more connections than they need at the time. They knew there's going to be a, a demand, more demand in the future, and we don't want to have to dig another trench or dig this up and replace them over the years. Let's plan ahead and put it extra. So they put in a whole bunch of fiber lines, turn on some of them, those are the lit ones, and start using them. Later on in years, as people say, we, we want fiber now as well, the dark fiber, the ones that had not been turned on, so they're off, dark, you can have those turned on. So, uh, and then you pay, you pay some sort of a fee to have them turned on and then use that as your connection. Um, in E-Rate, you'll see there's different choices for lit and dark fiber in the forms when you're doing your application. So, um, keep that in mind when, you know, however you're getting your fiber if you're able to get it. Uh, a third option is this self-provisioned network, which is a new way that some places are doing it. Now, most of our libraries in Nebraska, or, you know, all of our independent ones, you Probably guys probably would not do this, but for larger organizations, um, this is another choice you'll see when you're doing your form, um, where the customer, the library, actually uh, keeps um, runs it all themselves. Um, they just hire a vendor to do the construction, and they own and maintain it themselves, rather than going with a service provider out there. It's an option, like I said, not for most of our uh, typical li um, public libraries in Nebraska. Uh, one other extra thing that you can get as Category 1 that is construction related, and this is, they call it special construction, and there's questions on the form to apply for that specifically. This is um, the first time of getting your fiber um, installed. They know this is a new thing that is, you know, people are doing, and so they put it under the Category 1 that if you have lit fiber, dark fiber that you're turning on, um, or self-provisioned, that uh, you can um, get a discount on that as well. And this would include the, include the actual construction and any project management and design that needed to go along with that. So if there's a company you had to hire or that your, your city or county did, those costs would be eligible under Category 1 as well. Now, on to the voice phase down. Uh, each year since they decided to do this in 2014, the way, rather than just cutting everyone off completely from voice services, they're gradually reducing it 20 percentage points each funding year. So your discount goes down 20% each year just for the voice. This does not um, have anything to do with the internet. 
So the first year, 2015, you'll see here just the lowest levels are um, getting cut, having no support. Um, right now, we're in um, year 2017, so only only um, institutions who have a 70% or higher discount rate are still receiving a discount on the telephone, and that will be your 10, 20, or 30%. Next year will just be the highest ones, and by 2019, it's all um, gone completely. So for some of you, you've already, um, um, last year, for example, I, I submit an application for the Nebraska Library Commission every year for our telephone um, service. And we are at a 60% discount rate based on the Lincoln Public Schools uh, reduced lunch numbers. And last year was our, my, last, my last time being able to do it. I'm not submitting a form now for 2017 because we're down to zero. And these are the particular for voice services that are included in that phase down. Um, any sort of your basic local long distance, if you have 800 numbers, um, any voice over IP, satellite wireless, um, any circuits that are dedicated to phone service, all of these things um, that, that are considered part of voice services are what is being phased out. So any questions up to this point about what E-Rate is and Category 1? We're going to go on to Category 2 services next. You can type in your question section at any time if you do. All right, Category 2. Category 2, this is the um, equipment construction services needed to get your internet into and um, throughout your um, library itself. Category 1 is pretty basic. You pay a bill. It's discounted um, that percentage. Category 2, they came up with a whole different way of providing the discount to, to the libraries. Um, what they call, they've created what they call a five-year budget. Now, it's a budget in that it, it, you have to kind of think of it as not your typical budget as in, here's some money we're going to give you, and that's your budget, and use it. It's more of a... Um, Pretend budget is how I describe it, how I was able to explain it to myself when I had to figure out what they were talking about, meaning there's this amount of money that we're going to allot to you that you can get uh, use as, as uh, you can discount your, your bills from, and we're just going to track it, and every year we'll give you some discount over off of things over the five years. And I've got some concrete examples coming up that makes um, that explains this a little better. Um, category 2 services are, just, are broken up into internal connections, wiring, cabling, all the things inside the library. Um, a new thing, managed internal broadband services, um, which I've got an example of, and then basic maintenance of those internal connections, basically the ongoing service and maintenance and updating of them. So these are the eligible internal connections that are out there that, that you can get in category, that would fall in category two. This is, as you can see, all the physical stuff, um, your cables, firewalls, network switches, routers, the racks to actually put the equipment on, um, power supplies. Um, in addition, any upgrades and software necessary to make this the internet work. Um, now, this particular software and upgrades would be specific to things that have to do with running your network. So we're not talking like we need new mic new copy of Microsoft Word or anything, but um, things or we need to up, you know buy a new database to you know provide research help to to our users. This is things having to do with running your actual internet um, network. Uh, the new thing that they have added to here, and this isn't something that's new to the world, but it's new to um, E-rate, being eligible for E-rate, managed internal broadband services or managed Wi-Fi. This is where you can have a whole separate um, organization, separate company run your internet completely, that you don't even um, do anything with the operation management monitoring or anything of it. Um, a third party just does everything for you. You contract with them, and um, they take care of it on your behalf. So something to look into in your areas. Um, if there might be someone out there, if you're a little wary about keeping up with this yourself or figuring it out, this might be something that you want to look into if these kind of um, organization is out there. Uh, basic maintenance of internal connections. This is the other part of Category 2. This is, as I said, the updating, repair. If... Uh, my, my, my go-to example of squirrel chews through the, the wires in, in your library. Um, that is um, when somebody needs to come and repair this. Um, basic updating of your service and your um, software and anything. Um, 
what you need to think about when you're talking about basic maintenance, this is something that you would have a contract ahead of time with someone for. Now, it might be just through your actual service provider that they provide this as a service, um, or there may be some other different company or person in town who does this for you that you pay to come in and you know, keep things up. But before you apply for E-rate for this, you do have to have some sort of con contract or agreement in place saying this is who we would, we'd be going with and who would be taking care of this for us. You may also be paying some sort of a fee for this service, an extra like monthly fee for them to be on call or just to be as part of it, uh, as part of being a uh, part of your internet costs. That monthly amount just to have it as a service is not what's eligible. What is is actual work. So you may be paying some sort of fee for three months for them to be available, but it's not until that fourth month that you're due for an update of your software, or it's not due until that fourth month when the squirrel chews through your cables. When they actually come and do that work, that cost, that work, that particular job is what you can then get a discount on. So this is the kind of thing that you would wait until it happens and then you would apply for a reimbursement after the fact. In addition to all the category one and category two specific services, um, there's all these extra miscellaneous charges. All those taxes and fees that you pay on your bill, make sure you apply for the discount on those as well. It's not just your month monthly cost itself, it's all those taxes. Um, any training that needs to be done would be training for staff who are uh, training related to running your network. So if you have a, some sort of a tech person you need to send off to network training or takes a class of some sort on how to, how to set up and, and run a internet network or your library network, that training would be eligible for discount. In addition, um, there's a new thing that got added with the modernization, um, installation of equipment. Not all your equipment necessarily nowadays just comes from your, your official service provider comes in and does it. Lots of people, myself included, personally, go to Amazon or Best Buy or somewhere online to purchase the actual equipment, the routers and servers, and then you, need to have, you may need to have pay someone to come in and install it. You can now get that installation paid um, discounted as well. So you buy the piece of equipment, you get a discount on that equipment. Then when someone comes and installs it and they charge you for that installation, you can then apply to get a discount on that installation charge as well. So that is the basics of what's available to you um, as services for Category 1 and Category 2. Any questions before we go on to what the heck are Category 2 budgets? Anything you wanted to know more about if it is or isn't eligible. All right. All right, next up, we're going to talk about Category 2 budgets. As I said earlier, how you get your discount for Category 1 versus Category 2 is different. Category 1, it's a basic, your cost is this, we're going to put a per take a certain percent percentage off of it. For Category 2, what they've done is they are creating what they call their five-year budget. Um, uh, uh, based on the calculation I'm going to show you next, libraries are given a certain chunk of money that you can use towards any of those Category 2 services, and you can use them over a five-year period. It's not just for the next single year of E-rate, it's for anywhere from when you start applying to this up to five years out um, that you can use on all of those. Now, you don't have to keep your cost for Category 2 services and products below this amount of budget. It's just you will only be given a discount up to this amount. So you may pay $10,000 for some sort of installation and equipment for a new com updated computer lab, and your Category 2 budget is only $5,000. E-rate will help with that $5,000, but the extra $5,000 above is on you. Um, so you're, you're welcome to go and do whatever you want, just you'll just realize that you'll only be getting a discount up to whatever this budget calculates up to. So how much is your discount? For libraries, it's based on the size of your library building. So a space within the walls, multiple floors, whatever. Um, $2.30 per square foot. So if you have this information somewhere officially saying how many square feet the library is uh, through the city, uh, in blueprints, whatever, look for that, make do the calculation, and you'll know what your budget is. However, they do know that there's a lot of small libraries out there and they don't want to be having budgets of like, you know, $500. So there is a minimum that if your library is less than 4,000 square feet, you get that, you get a 4,000 square feet calculation right off the bat. Nobody gets less than that. 
So that would be $9,200. Um, and that's $9,200 to spend over five years time. So don't think, oh gosh, I've got to think of some big project for next year. No, you have things you can think of that are going to be doing over the next five years that you can you know, divvy up this money to spend over that time. For larger areas, population of 250000 or more, the um, cost per square foot is $5 because things cost more in more urban areas. So how do you figure this out? Your library is 3,500 square feet. Multiply that by $2.30, you get $8,050. However, you do have that minimum, so you actually have $9,200, and this is the pre-discount budget. This is before you've calculated in that discount calculation that we did with the school lunch numbers. So your budget's $9,200, but in this example, you have a, this particular library has a 50% discount rate, so the library will actually receive $4,600 in E-rate funds to spend on Category 2 services over the next five years. So you figure out what your budget is, then you calculate, you combine that with your discount, and that's how much you are actually going to be given, um, and not given as, here's a check for $4,600, it's we're going to track this amount of money in the E-rate system, and as you use it, deduct from it until you've used up all of that, um, toward, um, spending it towards Category 2 related um, services and equipment. Now, you can use this however you want to, however you need. Um, you could, you could, although I said you don't have to, you could come up with some big project next year. You know we're building a new building. We want to put a, all of it towards that, or we're upgrading a lab. We put it all towards that. Or you could split it up throughout the five years. Say, let's divide it by five, and each year we're going to look for things to spend it on, or any whatever works for you. Um, all it is is it does start on the first year you apply for Category 2, and then it's available to you for the five years after. You could skip a year if you wanted to. If you do something first year in 2017 and then you don't have anything to do in 2018 and then use some more in 2019, that's fine. It's just you've got five years to use it. Um, if necessary, they do recalculate your budget. If your library hopefully doesn't shrink but um, gets larger, if you put on an addition or build a new building that's a different size, then you'd put you tell them new the new square footage and that will be used to then recalculate your budget. And then they'll adjust it based on what you've already used and what's available. So basically what we're talking about here is they give you this amount of money that you can use and then they uh, track it for you within the system. You tell them each year what you've used it on, what you're going to be using it on, and um, use it up as you can. After the five years, the idea is that you will then um, start with a new five-year budget. Of course, we're only in like the second year of doing this, so we'll see how that works in practice. <laughs> Any questions about your budgets? It is a little weird and confusing and is very different. But once you get into actually uh, doing it in practice, it starts making sense as you're using it in there, in this in the E-rate process. If you have any questions, type them in. All right. All right. Next thing we have is technology planning. There we go. Um, many of you have done technology plans over the years. Uh, you have struggled through doing them, guess what? You don't have to anymore. <laughs> For E-rate purposes, technology plans are no longer required. Uh, it's still a good idea to have one, of course. Um, I will not say don't have one at all, but E-Rate no longer asks for technology plan. Um, this was only for internet-related things to make sure you knew what you were doing um, or you had a plan of, for the future of what you would be doing with, with your um, anything technology-related at your library. Um, it's also a good idea here if you are going towards, uh, if you are going towards accreditation in Nebraska, you can earn points towards your accreditation by having a technology plan. So that's a good thing. Also, these plans can be helpful to you when it comes to figuring out those Category 2 budgets. What do we have in our technology plan that we're going to be doing over the next five years or three years? Do we Are we planning that you know in two years we replace all of our computers and all of the networking things related to that? And then another year later, are we planning on doing this in our computer lab? These plans will help you figure out how you can use, apply for, and then use those uh, Category 2 services and that budget. Um, so, still think about having one, um, work, have one to help you keep things going, but as far as E-Rate is concerned, it's no longer required to supply for any purposes for, um, on their forms. Uh, 
There is still a question that you will, some questions you will, one certification that asks about it because for previous years it is still required and people may still be using that form. So you'll still see it mentioned and that's why I still mention it to you guys as well that um, you may still see it pop up around um, on forms and things, um, but you, for, for the future, starting with 2015 forward, you don't actually need to have one anymore. <clears throat> One other thing that you have to, to uh, think about before you get into E-rate is SIPA. SIPA is the Children's Internet Protection Act. This is about filtering the computers and the internet in your library, blocking the bad sites. Um, for E-rate purposes, you do need to be com in compliance with SIPA if you're applying for anything internet related, whether it's your monthly bill on the Category 2 or any of that equipment and construction and things that have, or Category 2, I'm sorry, Category 1 monthly bill or Category 2, um, all of the equipment and anything that falls under there. Uh, this is, there are three basic things that SIPA requires an internet safety policy, which you probably already have. You should hopefully have some sort of policy about how people can and can't use your computers, what they can and can't do on the internet, how to be safe on the internet. Uh, second thing, a technology protection measure, that's the filter itself, the actual software that you use to block the bad sites. Um, and a third thing is at some point had having a public notice or something, a, uh, an agenda item on a um, meeting agenda that talked about the fact that you were doing this, were thinking of installing these or you had installed them so that it's a public announcement there. There's information on the uh, USAC website about uh, SIPA, there are specific details on it. Um, now, I have, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, as, as I said earlier, telephone is being phased out of the E-rate program, which is going to leave only internet-related services and equipment and products available for E-rate, which means in order to, be, uh, to use E-rate, you're going to have to be com compliance with SIPA because everything is going to be internet-related uh, uh, by the time the phone is phased out. Phone was what you did not have to be in compliance with. So to continue or start doing E-rate, you do need to think about this and if you are in compliance. Uh, SIPA, as in uh, the filtering part of it, is, uh, can be controversial. Uh, in some areas. Um, libraries go from, there's varying opinions on if it should be done, if it shouldn't be done, if it's good or bad. Uh, varying opinions going from, of course, we need filters, we need to block um, everything that's bad, protect the children at all costs, up to the extreme other end as filtering is censorship and that is blocking access and freedom to information. Libraries all about freedom to information. Don't even talk to me about blocking or filtering. Don't want to hear it, and every variation in between. Uh, for E-rate purposes, however, um, the whole purpose of this presentation and my job here is to get you on board with uh, applying for and receiving E-rate funds. SIPA is actually not nearly as, um, I don't know if a hardship is the right word, to uh, a thing to deal with, um, at least to comply with it enough to um, get your E-rate discount. What's great about SIPA is it's short. It's short and it's vague. Uh, it's only, when, depending on how you print it out, which version of it, it's 12, 14 pages long, the entire act, not much to it, and it's not very specific. It does not say you must block Facebook and YouTube and this website and that website. Um, it says you must block visual depictions of things that are harmful to minors. And it's specific to minors, of course, they consider minors 17 and under. Um, it also says physical or the visual depictions. Obviously, it was created to stop the porn from coming into your library and the children seeing the pornography. Got it. Okay, good thing. However, there is no software at the moment unless anyone can tell me different. If you know something, that'd be kind of awesome because we need that in order to make this work. There is no real software right now that can successfully tell a visual depiction of something and block it as being um, the, the bad stuff that needs to not get through due to SIPA. Um, nothing, if there's a woman standing there in a tan colored dress, there's no, no software that can look at that and differentiate between the fact that she's wearing a tan colored dress or actually she's naked and it's actual flesh that we're seeing when it's the same shade. Uh, just didn't work. Hopefully someday maybe we'll have that, but we don't right now. So what we do is we kind of 
fake it. We do the best we can with what we do have, which we do have filters that will block certain websites that we know are bad, certain IP addresses, domains that we know are bad. There are white lists for good sites, black lists for all the bad ones out there, and that's what this software can do for you. Uh, what's great about SIPA2, it requires that you look at these things and decide what is best for your community as well. What is your level of need in filtering? For E-Rate and SIPA, all you have to do is have this technology protection measure, this filter, whatever it is, and have it installed in the computers. There is also an extra um, item in SIPA that states you must be able to turn it off for anyone, adult, who requests you to for bona fide research, uh, meaning some student doing, uh, some college student doing research on breast cancer awareness. That's the kind of thing that some of these these filters incorrectly will block. They'll see the word breast and say, ah, that's bad, block that site. The American Cancer Society website for breast cancer is not a bad site, and you have to go in and unturn that off. So when it comes to the censorship issue and the this is blocking access to all kinds of information, SIPA actually did take that into consideration when it was written. It was, um, you know, they thought about that and said, well, there will be times when you'll need to turn it off and let something through that got accidentally blocked. So it does have that um, out there for anyone who's concerned about we're going to be blocking people's information and that's horrible. You can just turn it off for anything you want to. Um, you can also set the low level of it very, very low so that it will block only the, 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 the least amount of sites. That's a good thing as well. Sometimes people never even come upon a site that it's, it's chosen to block and they'll never even know that you're doing it. But just by having that that um, software installed and having turned it on at some level, you get your 60, 70, 80 percent discount on all your internet related services. It's a really good argument to when you see that you can save that much money to look into this if it is something you have not looked into before. So if you're not doing internet already for E-Rate, I would encourage checking into this, um, seeing what you can do. There are, um, one thing also, SIPA does not tell you, it does not tell you what service, what technology protection measure you need to have, which um, software program you have to use. There's all sorts of different ones. There's ones that are installed individually on each workstation. There's one that can be just on your server. Um, your service provider may, may provide that service for you as part of your internet service, and then they block it and, and handle all of it for you. All those are options are available. I do have a links on my E-Rate website to, with information um, about uh, filters and things that are available, so you can go and investigate which ones are yours. There's some that are free, there's some that cost a little something. It, it's all over the all over the board out there. Um, so, as I said, going into the future, in order to uh, um, use E-Rate, you're going to have to be in compliance because everything's going to be internet related. But there are ways to just do do to comply that will not impose on what your li your staff is doing, what your live what your users are doing. Um, what else? Oh, one other thing to be aware of, and this is one thing also where people get a little confused about. SIPA does not specify that you only put these filters on the children's computers. This is something that a lot of people think. Well, it, the purpose of it is to block the um, minors from having access. We only have to have filtering on the computers that are in the children's room. Unfortunately, that's one of the bad parts about SIPA. It does not say that. It says it needs to be on all of the library's computers. End of sentence. There is no only the ones that the kids might use. It's anything, which includes, yes, your staff computers in the back room where you're cataloging people or doing, you know, cataloging the books. However, it does have that stipulation that you need to turn it off for when people need to do bona fide work. So to comply with SIPA, you install it across the board and then turn it off onto the computers that you don't actually need it on, the staff computers. Um, but the adult computers will be at a lower level than your children's computers. But you do have to have it in some way installed everywhere in case USAC ever comes to check up and see what you're doing. So any other question, any questions about SIPA and filtering and anything like that? Just taking my time here. Or, okay. Any questions about anything else that I've mentioned? The what's available, what the um, what you can or can't get a discount on, how your money is calculated, how you get your money. 
Are you out there? Wave. Say hi. <laughs> All right. We're about halfway through. We're at about 2.30 here. Um, as I said, we are, we'll go, we do, uh, this session is ex uh, actually um, two and a half hours. We'll see if we need to do, <laughs> hi, somebody did say hi, cool. <laughs> I'm not, you're all out there, good. Um, all right, so next we're going to get into the for the actual forms themselves. So next we're going to talk about the actual E-rate forms that you submit throughout the year to apply for E-rate and continue in the program. There are four basic types of forms that you submit. Um, there's actually um, six forms in the process, in, in the whole process, but you don't necessarily do all of them. Everybody does have to do the first three forms to get to, to participate in the program. That's that's a cut and dry thing. There's no getting out of those. There's a little bit of wiggle room on the 470, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. But um, Got to do one, two, three. That's your basic process. Four, and this extra new form I'm going to talk about, it depends. And I'll explain how it depends. Um, and we're going to go into the specifics of each one of these forms, too. Um, form 470, saying you're looking for E-rate support. 471, reporting on who, you, who your provider is, what the service is. 486, services have started. Um, I, I, I'd like to you know, get my money. And then the 472, 474s are about how you tell them you want your money to get to receive your discount. Um, there's a new form, 498. This is a new thing they're doing starting this year um, where you get your discounts now as a direct, if you do reimbursements after the fact, and I'll get into the details of that, um, a new form for you to provide USAC with your bank information to do these direct deposits. So um, this is a timeline of all the different forms. I also have this in more detail on um, the website, but this is just to give you an outline basically of what time of year, when things are done. You generally start this process in the fall, October, November, where we are right now. Um, in the spring sometime is when you do your second form. Later on in the spring, sometimes into the, not even until the summer, you do the third form. And then later fall is when you're working on figuring out your final forms in the process. Um, we do have, people always ask me, what is the deadline to start the process? What is the deadline for the first form, the second form? Uh, the way the deadlines run is um, interesting. Um, it's a little different than what you, it's not just a straight out deadline. Uh, form 470 is the first form of the process. You can apply for that. You can submit that right now. And I've got slides I'm going to go through showing you exactly how to do that. The second form of the process is the 471. 471 is only available during a certain time of year for about 75 days or so. And they call that the filing window. There's only a certain time of year you can do that. Um, the window for the upcoming year, it varies every year when that when those dates are. They, as of the last time I looked, just earlier this afternoon, they have not announced yet what the actual um, filing window is for the upcoming year yet. But the FCC did dictate to USAC, don't have it open before February 2nd. So we do know that much. It won't be any earlier than February 2nd. We just don't know the exact dates yet. When you do your 470 saying, I'm looking for um, E-rate and I want to get a service, it has to be out there 28 days before you tell USAC who you picked. You give service providers 20 days to contact you and say, yep, I'm up for doing E-rate for you and providing the service, whether it's your current one or a new one. In order to figure out what your 470 deadline is, you look at the close of the window for the 471, whatever the end date will be, which we don't know yet, and you count back 28 days, that's your deadline for the 470, the first form. So that's the very latest you could possibly submit your 470 is 28 days before the last day you could submit your 471, giving you that 28-day break there. Um, I wish I had the actual dates to give you because that would make this a lot easier, but as I said, they haven't announced them yet. Keep your eyes open for that. When they do announce it, USAC will announce it. I'll post it on our website and our mailing list and everything. Um, so this is just a basic timeline, and I'm going to get into the more details about this in uh, all the future slides. So um, in addition to submitting all these forms, you also must keep copies of them for 10 years after the last date of service. Last date of service is the end of a funding year. End of every funding year is June 30th, whatever year it is. 
for the year we're coming up to applying for now, 2017. That makes it June 30th of 2028. Um, anything that you, any forms you submit, any contact you have with service providers, any back and forth with USAC about your application, all of that stuff you have to keep for those 10 years. Now, you do not have to have reams and reams of paper and file cabinets full of them or binders full of things. All of this can be electro kept electronically if you want to. So anything you get that's paper, scan it, save it to a flash drive somewhere, save it into a file somewhere on your servers, wherever, in a folder somewhere. Um, just keep it available so if you ever do get asked by E-Rate, they can come to you anywhere ten, from 10 years back and ask for, um, I want to double check on what you did in you know 2016 for your application. And they'll be able to do that up until 2028. Um, E-Rate will do, does what they call audits of, of um, applications. This is not the same thing as an audit that the, that the IRS does, as in, oh my gosh, you did something wrong and we're coming to check on what you did. They do more of a checks and balances type thing. They do still do those kind of um, checks to see, you know, did somebody, you know, something looks a little wonky with this particular request. But they do a checks and balances things, basically making sure the program's working correctly. Is it useful to libraries? Is, is it easy for libraries to apply to do these forms? Any problems they had? So they do random checks and they get 50 to 60,000 applications a year. So they will randomly check some um, from those applications to do an audit of and then want to check it up on a particular application the year that you did and just see how did the process work? Did you get all the forms in on time? Was there a reason? Was there a problem with our process that we can improve? So that's why they may come to you for this information um, at any point. And you do just need to keep everything that had to do with that year for 10 years so that and if they need to, they can track how it all worked. Um, and here's a list of the kinds of things you would keep, the actual forms themselves, um, any correspondence from USAC, which right nowadays is all emails, so keep those somewhere, um, copies of contracts and agreements and receipts that you get from your service providers when you buy equipment, all of these kind of things. The forms themselves and the correspondence with USAC is now being kept in their new E-Rate portal that we're going to look at next, so that's actually a good thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. The new online system, uh, they will. They have said we will keep everything in there for ten years. That's a done thing. We are keeping it all electronically for you. However, if you're a little skeptical of that, or you prefer a little more of your own control, and this is what I've done, you can download PDF versions and copies of this all yourself. So you have your own backup copies, just in case. Up to you if you think that's necessary. Oh, okay. So. Um, so that's the basic forms and the process, and now we're going to go into actually the portal itself and specifics of each of the forms. So uh, the new E-Rate portal is called EPIC, E-P-C is the acronym, and that stands for the E-Rate Productivity Center. Um, they have said that it's pronounced EPIC um, for, for, the, for its acronym. Uh, starting in um, last year's funding year, 2016, most of the forms are filed within it. Um, the idea was all of them would be, however, one, a couple of forms didn't get uh, programmed into there yet. They just ran out of time. So um, it's almost all the forms are in there. There is a direct website you can use to go to it, portal.usac.org. Uh, also, you can get to it from the E-Rate website. I'm going to show you where that is as well. So why did they do this? Well, ultimately, the FCC told them to. <laughs> but the reasoning was to um, consolidate things, to streamline things, and make it easier for everyone, both libraries applying, service providers trying to deal with the libraries in USAC, and USAC themselves to track everything. Um, all stuff now, everything you do is now in one location. You've got one account that's your library's profile where everything related to all the different forms you do is on one place, one place you log into to access everything. Um, previously, if anyone has done E-Rate in the last few years, there has the forms have been online, but each one was a separate place to go to, a separate login for each form, and they were not at all connected to each other in any way. In this new portal, everything is all in there together, Everything is all um, connected to each other, all the forms that you do for over the year. Any questions that USAC has for you is all done through the portal as well. So anytime they question you on something, want to know more information, or you question them, it's all kept and, and saved in there for you. 
So having one place to go to is much easier than having to figure out all these different places. Um, also, the access itself has been, this is one of the uh, one of the really good things about it, um, from any device that you want to, you can use it on your PC, on your tap, tablet, laptop, any computer you have. You could even use your own smartphone if you wanted to. Uh, I wouldn't recommend um, submitting a form on here on this tiny little screen, but or filling in any of that information. But um, checking up on the status of something, that is something you could potentially do on a smaller um, screen. Also, you can use any browser of your choice. Previously, if anyone remembers, the online forms had to be done using Internet Explorer. Uh, if you, they just did not have the programming power or programming time to have their, their government programmers uh, create the forms that they would work both in Explorer and Firefox and Chrome, Safari, whatever you use. Uh, you could, and people did do this, submit forms using other browsers, and I did have some libraries do this, use Firefox. It didn't actually go through, however. You think you'd submitted something, you never got a certification, you never got a notification because it actually didn't really work. Behind the scenes, it only worked with IE. Now, you can use any browser. There is no longer a restriction. That is huge, if you ask me. Use your Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whatever you want to go in, it's all going to work, no problem. So it's much more easy to to get to it, to use it um, anywhere you, you, you feel comfortable. Uh, when, um, ERA, when USAC first set this up, they have automatically created an account for every library. So every organization who has ever done E-Rate before with um, USAC was created, um, an account was created for you in there. Um, whether you're a school, library, system, whatever, they um, created one. They also identified at that time a particular person at that institution to be their account administrator. Um, to start with, they looked at the 2015 applications, so two years before, um, the year right before they were started doing it, which was for 2016, where, um, and whoever was listed as the um, contact person on the 2015 Form 471, that person was designated as account administrator, and they were sent an email saying, hey, you've been set up with this account, go in there and start figuring out, you know, using it. Now, this was done before people needed to start applying for the form, so there's a little bit of confusion out there. Um, by now, though, anybody who's been using it should be acclimated and have some sort of an account, but I'm going to go into the details about how all this all works now. Except for one uh, particular form that I'll get to, you no longer need that PIN number that you had, um, where USEC would assign you a code number to certify and sign off on all the forms. And usually you couldn't remember it because it was a mishmash, a, a Genera automatically generated mishmash of letters and numbers and symbols. Now you create your own account, you pick your own password for whatever you want it to be, um, and maintain it yourself. Um, account administrators, you can also have multiple people have access to your library's account as well. So if you have a se separate person, an assistant director, or a tech person who you want to be in charge of this, you as the account administrator, if you were the one set up originally, can create an, a user account for that person and give them access to it. There are different levels of access you can give people as well. So if you have certain people you don't want to be able to do everything, you can give them view only or partial, access, partial permissions. Um, and then only you or someone else can have the actual, be able to actually submit your forms. So you can decide as, as necessary who gets what kind of level access. Now to actually get to USAC, there's a couple of different ways to do it. First thing on uh, USAC's on website, usac.org slash SL, that's SL for schools and libraries. Uh, upper right, they put up, uh, put in a button that is um, EPC. The epic button will jump you right to the login screen. Um, alternately, previously they had over here on the left says apply for E-rate. If you click there, it brings you to a screen that's about the e, um, epic system. And then there over to the right is where you can log in. Now, if you are brand new to E-rate, you are not doing it in 2015, you don't know what happened to the E or you just don't know where the email is for whoever it was sent to, to start up a new account, a startup doing E-Rate, you can contact USEC. They've got their 800 number here. You contact their customer service department, and they will be able to set you up with an account um, so that you can get in and use your library's um, uh, E-Rate 
account and, and start working on your forms or continue with the previous forms. Um, this happens a lot. A library director's left and did not pass on to the next person the access to the system, didn't give them a user account, um, or if you're just brand new wanting to try E-Rate or your library hadn't done it for five or six years and you finally want to pick up on it, you may need to contact them to get yourself set up and being able to use it. Now, when you first when you first set this up, they sent um, the account administrator an email. Um, unlike, and, and then they had sent them where they could go to log in and where they could use the forgot password option to reset and make up their own password. Um, when you first go into the E-Rate system to log in, you first get this pop-up box. When you click on that um, that little blue bot button here or up here. Right off the bat, it makes you agree to the basic terms. You're, you know, you're accessing USAC system. You have to say, I agree, the green, green button. And then it will ask for your username and password. Um, your username is your email address. Easy, whatever email address you use to do all of your work with um, USAC, that will always be your, email, your username. Um, password, you select yourself. Now, unlike many many other systems if you've ever applied for accounts in anything on any online systems there is not a create an account for me or set up an account for myself um, this is because from behind the scenes already USAC has created the library's account and potentially your administrator account and they don't want you going in and creating a whole brand new one so instead of that what you do is you reset your password you pretend you forgot what your password is and you create a new one the very first time you go in so when you hit reset your password, it will say, okay, give me your username, your username being your email address, and you request a password reset. It sends you an email that says click on this link to go and um, make up your new um, password. Very similar to any other time you've done this. Um, as it says there, you got 15 minutes to use that link. That's how long it's valid for. Uh, type in your username again once you use that link, and then create whatever you want your new password to be. Following these rules, as with many sites, they do have rules on how you, what 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 needs to be in your password. Uh, eight characters long it has to have a letter, a number, a special character, non-alphabet or number, one uppercase letter, and uh, at least one uppercase and one lowercase letter. So you've got to figure out some mishmash of all this stuff for yourself. Um, in addition, it says it has not been used in the previous four passwords. This new system, this new company that USAC got with, um, contracted with to create this system has some security rules where they make, they do make you change your password every 60 days. Uh, yeah, that is annoying. Uh, when USAC was told that that was a, the, the, how it worked, they said, that's going to be a hardship. We can't, these libraries come in every few months to do a form every time they come in you know, it's spread out over the year, they're going to have to do a new password. That's really, you know, that's a problem. And the company just said, well, there's just no way of getting around it. It's just how it works behind the scenes. Fine. So we just have to work with that. You'll note it. You'll note that sometimes you go, you'll note that sometimes when you go to log in, it will say your password is, has expired or is expiring or is invalid. And you need to just go ahead and reset it and make up a whole new one. Uh, easiest way to do this, um, set up a pattern of, you know, certain numbers, letters, char um, special characters, and uh, then just change the number each time, like whatever it would be, and put number one at the end. And then when they tell you to change it again, everything else can stay the same and just change it to number two. Uh, next time they tell you to change it, everything else can stay the same and just change it to number three on down the line until they let you reuse it. Um, it says here it has not been used in the previous four passwords. I'm on like, how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, and I haven't been able to reuse one yet, so I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is, but eventually you'll be able to just rotate back to your first one. That's, the, I, that's what they've been told. So um, that is just something to keep in mind when you're doing your passwords and using the system. It will ask you regularly to reset it. You just make up a new one, and it's all up to you what you want it to be. Once you have your password set, you go back and log in again using your same username and whatever password you just created. Um, they do have a remember me on this computer button uh, box here, which is something brand new. Just I just noticed it in the last month or so. I, I haven't checked on mine. I haven't noticed that it's actually remembering <laughs> my info. So it may be one of those uh, features coming. But at some point, it'll be able to, most likely what it'll do is remember your username and all you'll have to enter is your password. So once you do have your password set, then you go ahead and sign in. 
The very first time you log in, you will have to agree to their terms and conditions within the system. It automatically dumps you to that. You click on it to complete the terms and conditions. And this is, I've got two screens here because it's so long, you know, the long, all the rules and regulations about using it. And you just choose accept. Uh, at that point, it will pop you to your landing page. Now, this is a very obviously a very small text here that you're seeing on the screen. This is a full view of the whole landing page. And I'm going to zoom into different sections of it, of it to show you and talk about the different areas. But this is just so you see what there is. Uh, your landing page is your home page for Epic. Uh, it's where you're always going to start when you first log in. It's where you go back to whenever you need to do something. Throughout the whole system, you'll always have this universal service administrative company and logo. Um, here that you can use to go to, to come back to your landing page. Um, this all those blue box things there. That's our new logo. They just did that also uh, last month. They updated their website and came up with a new logo. Um, so you'll see some of my screenshots have an older logo because of when I took them. But um, anywhere in the system you are, click on that. It'll pop you back to your landing page again. Across the top of your um, interface is some menu items and I'm going to go into what they are all. First one is news. This is basically your inbox. This is where e, uh, USAC will contact you. They will tell you we are um, have some questions. We've, here's your notification letter for something. Uh, in this case, it's just showing a screenshot that there are weekly news briefs. Um, so this is where you will have all of that um, information there is um, consider news like an email inbox for you. Uh, second option is tasks. Tasks is anything that you're in the middle of working on. Um, the wording for these tasks is confusing. I think it's, it's, it could use some fixing. As you can see here in my examples, many of them say create, form, whatever. What it really means is once something is in your tasks to create these forms, that means you are actually in the middle of creating one. And it's saying, don't forget, this is here. You, you can still, you need to continue working on it and finish it up. So, um, it's a little confusing when you see it says create, which may make you think, and I've had this happen, I need to create one. No, this means you've already created one. There it is there. Click on that link to continue where you left off. The system will keep track where you, where you were in the a process of the form and, um, and jump put you back in where you left off. Next option over is records. Uh, this is a whole bunch of different things that you can go to for, for different reasons. The, the company that E-Rate went with with this, a Appian or Apian, I'm not exactly sure. I think Appian would be how it's pronounced. They, this is not where they, they did not go to a company and say, hey, build something for our E rate system, our E rate program. They said they found a company that has a system that could be used and they've kind of mushed E rate into it and are using it as best they can for um, E rate purposes. So um, many of the things here are just dumped into different areas and they don't necessarily make sense, the categories, but we just have to kind of remember where they are. We're kind of working with something that wasn't built originally for E rate, so we're using it as best as we can. So under records, we've got uh, where you can have, if you do an appeal for your, if you don't get what your money is. Um, entity information, information, but all their different forms. This is the first half of the screen. I've got a second screenshot of the second bottom half. Um, knowledge base center, so FAQs, information about things, list of service providers, uh, whistleblower cases, if something's going wrong, it's, somebody's doing something illegal in the system. So this is just a whole mishmash of those things. And there'll be various reasons why in your process you'll end up being sent to your records section to look at in those areas. Next option, many way to across the top is reports. They don't have much in here yet. Uh, they're not. They're still looking for what reports we might want to have come out from the system. Right now, as you can see, it gives you a link to go back to your landing page. But this logo to the left would do that as well. Um, they did just add um, with this new year um, my, my submitted modification requests. Uh, each time you submit um, forms in the process, the for, first two forms, you can. Afterwards, if you realize you made a mistake, you can make a change. You can fix it. And that's what they call modification requests. So that's where you would track those. Last item across the top is your actions. Uh, as you can see here, the whistleblower case is here as well. This is where you can contact USAC and you can search for any of your forms, your 470s and 471s um, from here, along with from some of the other places you can do it. So that's a, the free uh, menu items across the top. All the way to the right on that blue bar is the link to your particular profile. This is the profile for you as the person um, logging in and using the system. There's a little uh, 
triangle to the right of your name, but you would check on, click on that and it would open up a pull down menu where you can set some settings. This is where you also sign out of the system. Um, the system does, Epic does have a 60 minute timeout. So if after 60 minutes of inactivity, you don't do anything, it will automatically log you out. But if you just want to do it yourself, that's where you log out. This is also where you uh, work on your own personal profile information. Uh, they do have a section here where you can put in a profile picture if you wanted to. Like I said, the system is built for other purposes, is available for other purposes as well. I don't know why you would want to do a picture, but as you can see, I haven't, but it's there. But what you do to actually edit your, your um, profile and look at your personal one is over on the left, related actions. It brings up manage um, Epic user profile, and then you have where you can change the basic information about you. So if your name, um, address, or any of that changes, um, phone number, email, all that changes over time, you can update that in here if you need to. To add other users to the system, um, back to your landing page in the upper right hand point um, of your landing page, they have a lot of these quick links to different things. Um, as you can see, all the different forms you would do and then manage users. This is to add or modify um, a, a, a some, either your account or someone else's account you've set up or create a new one. Um, in this case, you check in the box next to your library's name and then create a new user. And then it just gives you that same information blank. Enter their name, um, what email address they're going to be used, and that's going to be their username for their account, what the address is. And then below this, and you scroll down farther, is the user permissions that I was talking about, that I talked about previously. Uh, you got full rights, partial rights, and view only users, so depending on how much access you want, you need someone to have. And then as you can see, for each particular form, you can have the, the um, permission set at a different level. So if for some reason you only have someone who's going to work on the first two but not the other ones, however it works along there, um, you can decide who does what. The only place that, that I can see that might in most of our library situations apply is for the 498. That's the one where you're putting in the banking information. So if you have someone who does know that info and that's all they need to do in the system and they don't want to tell you the banking information, you know, the, the routing number or account number, you could give that person access just to the 498, create a user account for them, then your money person, your clerk, whoever, um, can go in and enter that info for you. And, that's, and um, as you can see, the 498 um, permissions are slightly different than the ones for all the regular forms. They have um, your options for school or library official or general financial contact. Um, if you are the one who are doing all the information and entering it, you would choose school or library official. As you can see, they can do everything for the 498. Um, a general financial contact can submit things but can't um, do it and deactivate or take out any of the banking information. So that'd be a little thing you might want to be have some control over. So that's about use, putting uh, creating um, user profiles. Now if you want to work with your library, your organization's profile, you go to manage organizations from your landing page. Uh, same thing, you check in this case, very similar, check your library, hit manage organization, and then this is just information about your library. You've got your address, uh, latitude and longitude, longitude is not necessary to be um, some entered. Oops. Urban or rural status, this is where you um, tell them whether your library is urban or rural for the purpose of calculating your discount. This is the next section down. This is a long page too, so I've got each section of it in a separate uh, slide. Uh, your mailing address, if it's the same, if you have any other contact information you want to put in for the library. Uh, then basic library info, what kind of library is it? Public, private, anything else that applies, if you, it's a bookmobile, a main branch, and this is the one for the library commission, so I select state library agency. If you are just an individual library, which like 99% of our libraries across Nebraska are, you want to make sure you mark yourself as the main branch. You're the only branch, but you're also the main branch. That's how it knows that you are the one that's usually, uh, that is applying for this. Square footage, this is where you enter your, um, how many square feet your library is if you ever need to for um, calculate Category 2 funding. Next section down is your school district. If it's not in there automatically by default, as you can see here, I've already got it selected, you'll have a search where you can look up your school district. 
easiest thing to do is just type in, whoops, go back, type in the zip code of your city where you are, and then, because you don't have to enter every one of these, these are the four different ways you could search. Type in the zip code, do a search, it'll bring up any school districts, then you select the one that's for your, um, where your library is, and um, then it will know that that's the school district's numbers to use to calculate your discount. Um, previously, uh, libraries had to look up this information and enter it into the form. Now the information is actually pulled in from the schools that are using the system. So you don't have to know to enter that information anymore. It's automatically pulled in because the school district, for their own purposes, enters their school numbers. So that's a little makes it a little easier for libraries. So that's the basics of navigating around the system and working on your user and um, organization, the library profiles. Uh, any questions? I know anything about what I've, anything that I've mentioned yet? No? Yeah. Any specifics about your libraries that you want to ask me anything about? All right, on to the actual forms themselves. So first up, we have form 470. And I'm going to go through uh, a lot of screenshots of doing the 470. And then for the other forms, I don't have screenshots all the way through. They're all very similar. Um, but this is the one that you're going to be submitting right now. So I'm going to give you all the details on this. And the 470 officially opens a competitive bidding process. Now that it can be very weird and intimidating to to, to many to the libraries that well, why do I need to do this? Um, this is just the rules of E-rate how it works. When you're actually submit applying for E-rate, you are opening up to any service provider that might want to contact you and saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody to provide me with this service. My monthly internet bill, my monthly phone. I want to put some wiring or cabling in. Who can offer this to me? So it's like doing a request for proposal or request for quote. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get a lot of people contacting you, a lot of companies, and it doesn't mean you have to change. If you're just wanting to cruise along with the same providers you've had for your monthly bills, that's fine. But you are officially doing this. You just need to go through the, the steps for E-rate purposes, and um, um, I'll open it up to anyone. Uh, you just put in the basic information in your 470, what service you're looking for, what library it's for, um, all the basics, and you'll see that on the forms when we get into that. Because it is a competitive bidding process, you do have to officially, legally give any providers a chance to just learn you're looking for this and, and submit their, their quotes to you. That's what that 28 days is for. You need to have it out there for 28 days before you can officially pick who you're going to go with. Um, you may end up just going with your same provider because you're the only one in town. I know there's not necessarily five different you know, internet vendors in your town, but you do still have to wait to do it. As I said earlier, the file, there is a specific filing window for the 471, the second form. We don't know when it is yet, but it will not be before February 2nd of next year. So now is the time to do your 470. Just because that deadline will be coming up to next year, you don't need to wait. And please do not. If you wait until the deadline for the, you know, wait until January and the last day that's possible, you're going to have issues potentially, very, most likely. Their servers are going to get bogged down. Too many people wait to the last day. Uh, if there's a snowstorm, because this is going to be in winter still, and you can't get to the library to your computer to do it, or if your power goes out and you can't log on on the final day, you could be out of luck for getting your E-rate for the upcoming year because you couldn't get it in by the deadline. So just because there will be eventually announced an official deadline, do not wait for that. Please don't. <laughs> I'm begging you, do it now. The 470 is out there, it's available. Go ahead and put your info into it. And at least get that done, checked off your list of things to do. Next um, February, when the 471 becomes available, then you can start working on the second step in the process. There is one case when you might not be able to have to do a 470. They're trying to convince service providers to offer really high speed internet at a really good price to schools and libraries. If you can find somebody who is offering this particular setup, then you can skip the 470 and you just automatically wait until February and report and saying who you're going with. So you need to get at least 100 megabits download and 10 megabits upload speeds, uh, $300 or less per month. 
Um, and it's something that is publicly commercially available for anyone, not just a special deal because you're doing E-rate. So I haven't heard of any libraries doing the, getting to this yet in Nebraska, but quite a few, especially this year, are talking about they're really close. They're getting 90 megabits or they're down or seven upload, and they're going to go and talk to the provider and say, hey, do you can you bump us up a little, and then we can skip this whole bidding process, this whole competition thing, and we just automatically go with it. So look into that with your providers. Ask around. See if this is something that's out there and see if you can um, get on board with at least being able to skip this one part of the process. Now to do your 470, back on your landing page in that up menu, there is a link to the FCC Form 470. And as soon as you click on that, it starts up an application for you. This also automatically puts something into your tasks that is the create a Form 470 link that you can then keep using to go on and continue if you need. It automatically pulls in from your library's info, the, um, your library's profile, the basic info. This is something that previously you had to every time you create, wrote, com, created a form, you had to enter this yourself every time. Now it automatically just dumps it all in there for you. It makes it so much quicker and easier that you don't have to type in and all of this info. We'll make sure it's correct. But you do have to give it an application nickname. This can be anything. Um, that you want. Uh, it's just a nickname for this particular form so that if you have to track it later or they need to contact you that um, they'll, they'll refer to this nickname that you create. Um, Okay, I do have a question that just came in, which is actually, this is actually a good time for that question, Stephanie. Uh, someone asked, what if you were under contract? We always got free internet, as I mentioned before, but had to start paying this year, um, but for the cheapest rate, we signed a three-year contract. Um, if you're already under contract with someone, you're gonna have to do a little um, change, for, change that up a little bit. The E-rate process itself is you do a 470, saying we're looking for someone to provide this service. People can't, library, can't you, you figure out, who, somebody contacts you, then when you do the 471, that's when you report who you've chosen, and that's when you're supposed to sign any new contracts. You can't have a previously signed contract, then you go in and say, I wanna get an E-rate e discount on that. You have to give anyone else, the way they think of it, you have to give anyone else um, a chance to contact you and um, you know compete with whatever someone else has given you in this contract. So the process is 470, wait 28 days, sign a contract, and do the 471. Now, if you've already signed a contract with someone, I would recommend contacting them and saying, hey, we want to do E-rate with you now, though, so we need to change this up. We need to stop this contract at the time when we're doing the 470 and re-sign. We're going to have to sign a new one that comes starts in next February when the 471 is available. Now, the th I think you said, yeah, three-year contract. Very often doing multi-year contracts, that's a good thing because you will get, they'll sometimes give you a cheaper deal, as you said, that um, by, do, by locking it in for three years, and that's fine. For the first time you do this, as like I said, you do your 470, you wait, you do your 471, sign a new contract. If you've already got a contract with a company, contact them and say, hey, can we amend this contract to end next spring sometime so that when the new E-rate year comes up, I can re-sign a new contract that starts at the right time along with the 471 and start that three-year process over again. Most companies who've done E-rate before, they know this. They'll, 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 they'll be willing to negotiate that with you and work that out so that you can both be on, on, online um, with the E-rate, e lined up with the E-rate funding year. Now, if you had... At once you do that your first year, the next year you do not have to do a 470 for that particular service, for that internet, because you already did that open bidding and picked the provider the first year. For that particular service, you wait and skip to the 471 the following year, the second year of the contract. You don't put it in the 470 again because that will open it up for bidding again and that will you know start the whole process. You wait and just go to the 471 when that's available on year two and just report that, yes, we're still with the same company. And then on three or three, the same thing. Skip the 470 and just start the process with the 471 saying, yes, we're still with that same company. After that third year, then the next one, you'd have to start a new 470 to open it up for another three-year contract. So does that help? Does that explain? 
if you already got a contract, you might have to do some negotiating with your provider to end it so you can start a new one. And then for all those years of that contract, you skip the fund, the um, open bidding and just continue with the same one. Cool. All right. That works. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the question, because that is something that some people need to know about. <laughs> so when you are in your 470 form, there's some buttons across the bottom. Discard form is on the left. At any time in the process, up until you've submitted it, you can always discard the form completely and cancel it. If you realize that you did something completely wrong or you just want to start over because you weren't sure about what you were doing, you can always discard and cancel out the form. You also have save and share and save and continue. Generally, you use save and continue just to go on to each step in the process in the form and move along until you get to the end and you submit it. Save and share is only for the case of if you are the person who submits the info in the form, but someone else has the authority to sign off on it and you have to share it to them, to their user account in Epic and have them do the actual signature and certification. In most places, in, you know, for our libraries, it's the same person doing everything, so that's not necessary. So most likely, you'll just use save and continue on through the whole form until you submit it. So after you get your nickname in there, you save and continue to the second page. Second page, your 470 is just confirming here's all the info about your library. Is it all correct? If it is, you're good to go. If you notice something needs changing, you've got to go back to your landing page and to manage organizations and update and fix anything. Otherwise, you save and continue to the next screen. Consultants. There are companies out there that you can pay to do your E-rate for you. Generally, that's for large group organizations like multi-branch library systems or school districts that have so many different things and it's such a complex application that they need someone else to take track of it. Um, if you don't have anyone, um, this would also be in your organization profile to keep that, just to save that info. So you can just leave that blank, but you do need to tell them the other underneath that, that you are the main contact person. If you hit yes, because it's you, it automatically puts in your personal information from your profile. Boom. And then you save and continue. Next is when you actually tell what services you're going to be looking for. You can do category one service by clicking on the button, turning it green, or you can do a 470 for category two, or you can do one for both your choice. Um, I, in this example, I've done a, um, one on both so you can see how they both work, but you can do however you want. You can have multiple 470s out there. If you know, for example, right now that you'd like to do just the monthly phone and internet and you can shoot off that 470 for the category one right off the bat, fine. But you're going to look into category two because you hadn't investigated it yet and and you want to see, you know, what might we, what we might be doing over the next five years. Uh, look at, uh, I want to look a little closer at our technology plan or our strategic plan to see what we're working on. And then you can come back and do a second 470. You can have more than one out there that'll just be your category two. Up to you, however you want to have it work out. Or you can wait and do all at the same time. Um, so you check whichever ones you want. They turn green. You save and continue. It will then ask you if you have a separate RFP, a separate request for proposal, a separate request for quote. For large um, projects like a new library building or a whole new computer lab, you probably have something a lot more in depth than what a 470 tells people and about what you want to do, about what the project's going to project's going to entail, about what sort what actual equipment you need, and you can upload that document into the Epic system so that any prov service providers that might come along and want to investigate applying, you know, submitting a, a quote to you can see that information. This is where you could do that. If you don't have anything big like that, you would choose no instead and then just go on to the next step. Now, uh, okay, and then this is where you put in the actual services. This is also a big, you know, hard to read on the screen, I'm sure, but I'm going to go into the details of these sections. I just want you to see the whole page. You have a section for service requests for Category 1 and for Category 2. This is because I selected both of those on my previous screen when I had the choice. If you'd only choose one or the other, you'd only have those available to you at this service request point. You can also see here now at the top, this does have a bar that goes across the top uh, tracking where what step you are at in the process. So you can see um, where you are along, going along. So we're going to zoom into our category one. 
and to, what you you're, whenever you're applying for E-rate, you're at, you're you're requesting services, whether it's an actual service as what we think of as in your monthly bill, or it's the equipment you're buying, the installation, whatever they call it, a service request. So to start a new one, you click that green button, add new service request. And then for category one, it will have a pull down menu. It'll show you that it'll have all the different choices of what you can do under category one. This is all your the basic ways of doing, having your internet. Um, you, your dark fiber is here, your lit fiber, your internet access is here. Uh, voice service is the last choice for as long as that's around. So you choose whichever one you're doing, um, you're asking for. In this case, I think I did, yep, ISP service, so your basic monthly internet. For this particular one, and depending on which service you choose, it's going to ask relevant questions for that service. In this case, it's asked for your minimum and maximum speed capacity, how fast, what's your minimum you want, and what's your maximum you're looking for. Your 470 is kind is think of that as dreaming. What is the best I could get? Now it might not be available, but it doesn't hurt to ask. It's not till your 471, the second form, that you tell them what you actually ended up with. So you can think big here as far as your maximum capacity. I only put 50, but you can put down 100, 150. I think they even have gigabit choices there. I know that some towns, some cities are getting that. Put that down. Make sure though that it will at least encompass what you can get. Not that it's too low. If you say we only want 25, but there's a provider that offers 50 in your town and comes to you, or your provider says we'll give you 50 megabits per second, you and you only put 25 as your maximum on your 470, you'll only get an E-rate discount up to the 25 per, um, megabit per second cost. So think big here. The 470 is where you get 471 is where you get specific. Number of entities, you're just one library. You put one, and then this is that special construction. Do you need installation and construction and maintenance for this? If it's just continuing with your regular monthly you know, costs, you'd say no. If it is something new, then you would say yes to get that on the application. And then it's added to your list of category one requests. The table comes up, with all the basic info. Also, there's a narrative down here where you can type in any extra information you might need. If this doesn't, if you think this doesn't give enough info, and you don't have that full-on RFP that you uploaded, here is just a free text box where you can get specific. I just wrote monthly internet access for public library. Uh, we're going to add a second one now. We'll click the green button again, add new service request, and now we're going to do the voice one. Voice service is just only, there's only one choice for that because it's all grouped together. It's the last choice on the pull down menu. Once you choose that, you click the add button to the right. And this asks you different questions. Quantity for voice means number of phone lines. Do you have a phone line and a fax line and 800 line? Um, however many you have coming in um, to the library. Number of entities, you're still one library and whether or not you need that construction again. And now you'll see once you click the add button here, you'll see it's now added to your list of services. Same thing, we can add now more to that narrative. In this case, because you'll notice there's not a lot of detail in the phone uh, description when you use the pull down menus. This is where you would specify it's for local and long distance telephone service for my library. If it was for a fax line or something else, this is where you would detail that because there's nowhere else built into the form to tell them what you're looking for. So that's all we're going to put in for our category one. Scroll down a bit. There is an installment payment plan question. This is something new they added. They know that sometimes some of these services for the installation can cost a lot. And if there are companies that are willing to put you on a payment plan for that as the library, E-Rate will work with that as well as far as giving you a discount. So you can say if that's something you're going to be doing or not. Um, we're also now going to add our Category 2 request. Click Add New Service Request under Category 2. And this gives you different choices because it's related to the Category 2 services. Your internal connections, your basic maintenance of those, and then that managed internal broadband services that manage Wi-Fi. Um, I'm just going to do one example here. Um, you get a different pull-down menu for your internal connections, all the different equipment that you can get a discount on. And I chose cabling, needs some wiring. Um, in this case, it tells you the unit we're looking for is how many feet do you need. Depending on what service you ask for, it's going to give you ask you different questions. You can choose a manufacturer if you have a preference. You don't have to. Um, it always says the manufacturer or equivalent as well. So if they don't can't find the exact company you want, 
you know, brand you want, you can. And then are you also, in this case, needing the installation? In this case, I want some cabling. And yes, I would like someone to come and install it for me. You add that one, and it comes up on your list now of your Category 2. If I needed to explain a little more about it, I could, whoops, go back. I could, in this narrative box underneath Category 2, explain a little bit more about where the cabling is going, why it's going in, anything like that. Now, at this point, if I have more equipment that I want to do for Category 2, I would go in and add another new service request. I'm going to go back to that pull-down menu here. For each one of these pieces of equipment, everything here on the list that you have, you're going to need to do a new service request for each one. If you're going to be buying some racks and routers and switches, you're going to be doing three different service requests. So do this whole thing that I just went through for the cables three more times. Um, so this is going to be a repetitive thing for each thing you want to get. Everything here on this pull-down menu is going to, if you want to choose something new, it becomes a whole new request that you go through the process of putting in there, and then you end up with a long list of all the different things that you wanted. There's not just a one-shot thing and then write a long description of everything. You have to pick it from here each time. So depending on what you're doing, you're going to be adding all of those and ending up on here with a much longer list of a whole bunch of um, equipments. For demo purposes, I just did the one. Um, and now here's what you would end up with your Category 1 services, the, the basic phone and internet bills, and then here all my equipments would be listed down here. Once I've got all of them on there, then I save and continue on to the next pay screen in the form rather than choosing the green, using the green button to add another service request to this list and adding to it. So it depends on if you need to add more. Uh, Save and continue, you have, do you have a technical contact person? Is there someone else you prefer a service provider to contact if they have questions about this uh, service or about the installation or about the construction? If there is, you can enter it. If not, you don't have to. If it's just you. Um, for yes, you can either create an account for them in Epic, which generally isn't necessary because it's your techie person might not need to get into E-rate stuff, but you can also enter their details yourself which is manually, name, phone number, and email address. Next question will ask you if there are any state or local procurement requirements. This is any rules that the state or your local city or county has about how you can ask for services. Do you have to go through a certain process when you're doing an RFP or something? For major contracts, there might be major construction, there might be. For the state itself, at the state level, we don't have any rules. You guys can do whatever you want, um, but you might want to look into when you're doing something more than just my basic monthly and some pieces of equipment. For more construction projects, there might be some sort of rules. And if there is, you'd upload them to here. Once you're done with that, the last, now you're done with all the basic parts of the form, you can review your FCC Form 470. Now, when you hit that button, it starts working on generating a PDF. This here, which is a static screenshot, this is one of those little circular snake things that goes round and around and around as it's working on it. So it's going to keep working on generating it. What you have to do is keep hitting the refresh button, this green button here, to see if it's done yet. It won't automatically show it to you when it is done. You have to keep asking. I had to learn that the hard way by staring at the screen for about five minutes and wondering why it wasn't working. So wait 10, 20 seconds, hit refresh. If it just pops back to this page, wait another 10, 20 seconds, hit it again. For me, it usually took two or three tries, and then I finally would get it. Once it is ready, it will then give you this screen where it has a link to actually look at the PDF version of your 470. You'll notice here there is also the button, the green button to continue to certify, but it's not live yet. It's grayed out. You have to check this box to certify that the PDF is correct before it will let you certify. So it kind of gives you a little check of, Make sure you did everything correctly. You click on this hot link here, and it will bring up the PDF. And this is a long PDF. It's just a copy of what you had entered into the form. Basic library info, your particular service requests, tech contact, any other information you had in there. At this point, from this PDF, if you wanted to, you could save it to your own computer, so you have your own copy of it, print it out, whatever you want to at this point. It's also saved electronically in the um, system itself, but if you want to back up, this is when you would do that. Once you're sure everything's correct, you check the box saying it's correct, and now it will let you continue to certification. And it says, are you sure? It wants to make sure you're sure you're done. Are you sure, sure you're done? Are you really sure? You say yes, if you are. And then this is where you check all those boxes. 
Um, you've seen this before in E-rate forms. Um, I do have a zoom in to the certifications. This is just agreeing to all the rules of um, the E-rate, the legality of I certify that I'm the right person to do this, that we're going to use it for um, in the library educational purposes. Um, it'll all be done in the up and up with, with um, open bidding, all of that stuff. So you have to check every single one of these boxes and then in the lower right, you then check the certify button. If you don't check all the boxes, it won't let you certify anyway. So it'll come, pop up with an error saying, hey, you missed one. So you really can't get past this without checking them all. It will then come up with the scary false statements on this form and result in civil liability or criminal prosecution. This is a legal form you're submitting. So it does you know, give you that uh, warning that are you, you know, this is something you're doing. Are you sure? You, of course, got to say yes to submit it. And then you pop back to your landing page. Now, if you go to the bottom under FCC forms, this is where you can look up any of the forms you've previously submitted. Um, you'll be able to choose actually 470, 471, and 486. In this case, I'm just showing you how to look at the one we just did. Um, and whether they are actually been done or you're still working on them, it'll bring up all of them. In this case, I've got ones I certified that I've done and one that I'm still in the process of, and it's incomplete. The nickname over here is a blue hot link you can click on. And then it is now here is the online version of the form with all the information in there. Same thing as that PDF, just online. You can print this if you want to do. Um, do a screenshot of this one. Uh, in addition, it sends you a notification letter, receipt notification letter, which used to come in the mail. If anyone remembers, you used to get these colored pieces of paper, pink, blue, um, yellow, that you'd actually physically come to you in the mail. They're not doing that anymore. It's all coming online in the system. This is in your news section. It is will be the most recent thing in the news, and it says your, your form has been uh, certified and received. And it tells you here the allowable contract date. Allowable contract date is the 28 days after the form was submitted. That's when you know you're able to do your 471. In addition to being window, of course, you have to wait for the window to be open. But it tells you right here, now you've got to wait till, in this case, when I did this one, it was, I had to wait till April 26th of 2016. So you'll see that date and you'll, um, you'll know that's as long as I have to wait. Basically, you do this and then you sit back and wait those 28 days. Don't do anything for that time. So that letter, it summarizes the information. You can use that letter to make any corrections. If you just realize after the fact that, oh, wait, I did do something wrong, you can always go back and fix it. And I told you it gives you your date. When that allowable contract date, when those 28 days are up, they will actually send you an email telling you the date has passed, been reached, and you can now do your 471. Pretty awesome. So they will give you a reminder letting you know when that time is up. Now you do have to wait for the window to open. But this is pretty cool. I thought what they they proactively nudge you and say, hey, it's time to do the 471 if you can. It also ends up that um, notification about the allowable contract date into your news items as well. That hey, so everything they they notify you with um, ends up in multiple places. After that date has passed and you, the 28 days has passed and it is the um, window has opened this is when you do that comp that um, evaluating and choosing uh, who you're going to go with if you get multiple uh, contacts multiple companies that contact you there's a chance you won't get any and that'd be awesome you just cruise along with your current uh, provider but if you do get anybody that contacts you you do have to do some sort of evaluation for um, e-rate purposes so they know why you chose this the who, who you chose um, Look at if, if you do get contacted from anybody, look at what they send you. Make sure it's for the services you asked for and make sure they actually offer service in your city, in our state. We have got companies out there that are just doing a fishing expedition and just looking for anybody who might want E-rate services. And I've had many libraries, I just had one a couple weeks ago, say someone from his Alabama contacted me, a company, and I contacted them back because they had a good deal. And when I told them where I was, they were very confused that I was, I mean, why you're in Nebraska, but we're in Alabama. It's like you reached out to me. They're just not paying attention. So pay attention. If they're not offering services in their area and they're off and they say, hey, we have something that you didn't ask for, you don't have to even look at their bids or look at our, you know, take them in consideration. I've actually, here at the Library Commission, as I said, I did telephone for the commission. We just have basic landlines that we apply for. I get emails all the time from companies wanting to offer a cell phone service. Well, cell phone service wasn't on our 470. 
so I can just delete those and ignore them. So just keep that in mind, pay attention to what it is. However, if it is something that is a valid service and you, you know, that, and they do offer a service in your area, you do have to do some sort of an evaluation. This is just so that if E-Rate or any other companies question it, you will be able to tell them why you picked who you picked. Why did I stick with my same company, even though some new company came in and gave me a better deal? Cost has to be, it's a cost effectiveness is what they're looking for. And cost has to be the primary factor, the thing you look at most importantly, but not the only thing. And this chart that E-Rate has put together, I think is a really good example of how you can do this kind of a comparison. Think of all the things that are important to you in picking a service provider. Assign points values to them. Cost has to have, the price of the service has to be the most, the highest point value. But then everything else and it all adds up to 100. Then when you, if you get contacted by multiple vendors and it's a service you're actually looking for and they you check with them and they actually will provide you service in your town, you then look at it and assign points. You'll see here what we have is two vendors, one and three, who we know. We have pretty good pricing. A new vendor came into town. We don't know them at all. Prior experience with vendor is zero, but they had a really cheap, they had the cheapest price. So they got the full 30 points for their price. However, when everything else was taken into consideration, vendor three got the most total points, and that's who you would go with. Probably that's your, your local guy that you've always, the local company you've always been with. You don't know these guys. You don't know if they're any good. Um, and this is perfectly a valid reason to pick them. And if you ever get asked, this does not have to be submitted with your forms, but this is good to have just in case you're ever asked after the fact, comp vendor two says, hey, we are cheaper than this vendor three in town. You should have gone with us. We're going to complain. This here, if you have this little chart somewhere or even a memo to yourself saying this is the reason that and it is this kind of reasoning, that is what you can show to them and to E-Rate if they decide to ask you, this is why. We have no experience with them. And our other vendor, we have more experience with them, and that's why we went with them. It didn't matter that they were just the cheapest. Um, another category you could put in here is, um, I, I need to add that, knowledge of um, customer service. If you know that a company really is bad at customer service and it's the other one that I've been with is good, that would be something else that could be a good reason. We've heard about them and um, our experience from other people says they're terrible at customer service. We didn't want to go with them. Our current company was better. That would be a reason. So just keep that in mind if you ever get any um, multiple contacts from companies. If you're lucky, you won't have to worry about this at all. All right, any questions? We got about a half hour left, and I will be able to get through everything that we have left here in that amount of time, not a problem. Any questions you have about that first 470? That's the first form in the process. Um, that's where you get started. The form is available right now. Go out, maybe not today, because this is getting late in the day. Tomorrow, when you get into work, do your 470. There's no reason to wait to the deadline. Um, just get it out there if you're ready to put down what you're looking for. Um, if you want to investigate your four or your category two stuff a little more, that's fine. Do a 470 for your basic services and then go investigate your four category two things and do something later this month, sometime in January. Uh, however works out best for you. Any other questions, any questions yet right now about the first form, the 470, before we get into some of the details of the other ones? All right. On to the rest of the forms. So the second form of the process is your Form 471. Now, from this point forward, I do not have uh, screenshots of every single screen um, like I did in the 470. Uh, that would have made this, this uh, workshop another hour and a half longer, and nobody wants that. <laughs> um, also, these form, this form is not even going to be available until next February, and there is still a chance certain things might change on the form, and I didn't want to give you guys screenshots of something that might end up looking completely differently. Uh, there will be information on the uh, USAC website of screenshots if anything does get majorly updated. Um, but I'm going to give you a few things and at least information about these forms that you will be doing um, next year. The 471 is the form that you do after um, your 28 days has passed 
um, from your 470 and the window has opened, this is when you tell USAC who you've picked for your provider and what the service is actually going to be. Um, this is also when your um, discount calculation is pulled in to show how much money you're going to um, get, how much discount you're going to get. 471 comes from the same place, upper right hand part of the screen here, or you click on the 471 and it starts off, this is the first screen, very similar to the 470. Um, basic information, give it a nickname, and go on and start entering in all this, the basics of, of what, you're, what you're ending up with. You can see across the top here it has where it will track as you're going through the form. As I said, you wait till the 28 days, your allowable contract date has been reached. Um, and you sign a contract if necessary. If you have an ongoing contract, you don't have to sign a new one every year, no. Um, and the window has opened. As I said, we don't know when, but it won't be before February 2nd. Uh, there is an FCC registration number that's now part of this form that they asked for. It's actually in your profile of your organization profile. Uh, if it's not automatically in there from you previously doing it, you can look it up on the FCC website. It's just a number that everybody's been assigned this ever, who, as they say, does business with them. Um, if you don't have one, you can request one. Um, easy, they send it to you quickly in the email. Um, but that is something new that libraries have not had to do in the past. When you're doing your 471, each service that you have asked for, uh, whether it's your monthly internet, your monthly phone bill, your different equipment, your installation, is assigned a funding request number. Uh, this is a number that USEC may use to contact you and ask you for more information about. Uh, the provider itself also has a SPIN number assigned to them. They might have more than one, so this is just a tip. Uh, make sure you're using the correct one with them. Uh, if you've been using the same provider for years and you're just using the same one, you should be good. But if it's somebody new, double check to make sure you're using the right ID number for them. Sometimes they like, they've like they had have set up multiple um, numbers for different uh, services that they provide. But your service provider will be able to get you that. Just like the 470, after you submit the form, you'll get a letter put into your news that summarizes what you did. You can also use that to chew, make any corrections if necessary. Uh, that ends up just like the 470 in your news. You're going to notice there's a lot of repetition in these forms. You go through the form, submit it, certify it, a letter goes into your news item. Go through the form, submit it, certify it, a letter goes into your news. You also get emails letting you know at the time when you get this letter too that the form's been certified, it's been received. So you're going to get a lot of things happening um, over and over again that are all very similar. Once your 471 has been submitted, this is when um, your application is reviewed. And this is when you wait. And you wait, and you wait for months, possibly. Um, this is when um, USAC will look at your form, see if everything's correct, see if they have any questions, uh, let you fix things, update things, make changes, whatever. If you do hear from USAC, they will send, you'll get an email saying they have a, a request that they, you need to answer. You have to go into your Epix account. You've got to log in to answer the questions now. They don't do things with faxes as we used to do or emails back and forth. They want everything collected into, this, into your account so it's all there for anyone to look at in one place. If someone does contact you and you don't know what they're asking for or you can't figure out, this is when you reach out to me. I can translate, and I do it for many, many libraries. I know some of you guys are on the line who I've done this for. I can translate what they're asking for, what they're, what they're trying to say, what they're looking for, what they think is wrong with your application, whatever. Um, USAC has a tendency to take four paragraphs to say something that could take like two sentences to ask. So. Um, if you're not sure what you're supposed to do, contact me. I can log into your account and help you figure out how to answer. The group in USAC that does this work is called their Program Integrity Assurance, PIA is the acronym for that. So you'll, you'll get a, a contact from you know, Bob Smith, PIA reviewer, USAC, and that's who um, um, you need to reply back to with any of these questions. Once you've done any back and forth with that, if there are, um, if everything's been answered, that's when your funding commitment decision letter will be issued. This is a letter that will let you know if you have been funded or not, and or maybe reduced funding adjustments have been made. Um, you might get more than one of these. For example, if you submitted more than one 470 and 471, you may have more than one of these because they may you know, evaluate um, and uh, then review them differently. 
When this letter is available, that calls it a letter just like everything else used to be mailed to you. Now it goes into your Epic account just like all the other notification letters. You'll get an email that says Epic Notification E-Rate Funding Commitment Decision Letter Available. Look for this email. You never know when this will come. It could be in July, August, September, November. We've still got libraries. We're getting it this month. Well, last month. You'll need to look at find notice that this has come in. It will not tell you in this email what the answer, what your what their response is. You'll have to log in to your Epic account to actually see the funding commitment decision and what they've said. When you log in at the very top of your landing page. This is where you can look up all the different notifications for any of your forms. You choose the notification form type. You'll choose FCDL, that's for Funding Commitment Decision Letter, and the particular appropriate funding year. It will then list it right here. When you first go to this, and I missed getting a screenshot on that, unfortunately, it will say Generate Notification. You click on that, it reloads this landing page, and then it says View Notification. That's when you can go ahead and look at it. Viewing it will pop you over into your news, just where everything else is. You have to generate it yourself. They want to know that you actually went and did something and realized that it was there. So you do have to physically generate it by clicking that button. Um, down here is, this is just the letter where it says, thank you, we've received it. Here's all the information down below, what your next step is. There's a, you can barely see the bottom here. I'll zoom it out a little. There is a spreadsheet you can click on and open up and see the actual details of all the funding requests. But they do summarize it here as well. Um, this is mine from last year um, on August 6th. They said it, they approved us for our $2,300, $320, and we're good to go. So from there is when you would go on to the next form in the process. But if you were denied, you can do an appeal. Uh, or reduce and you don't agree, um, we can go through that with you. I've done it with many, a few libraries over the years. It takes some time. So do be prepared that your appeal will not be an immediate fix and immediately getting the money, but um, you can do an appeal and we can see about getting things um, fixed that you think might not were incorrectly denied. So after you have your funding commitment decision letter, the third form you have to do is the 486. And this is where many libraries lose it in the process, as in they think they're done and they're not. They've gotten a, a notification, a funding commitment decision that says, yes, you've been approved. And they're like, yes, I did it. I'm done. I got my money. No. What that letter actually means is this money has been set aside for you and you need to let us know that you still want it. There may be reasons you don't want it. It may be I've um, changed my mind about the service provider. A uh, service has been changed. I need to do, you know make a change to what I'm actually getting as a service, whatever. But you've got to use the 46th up to the f first three forms you always have to do before you can get any money. So this is a very easy form, actually. All the information you need is actually in that funding commitment letter, and it's automatically in your account. To get to your 46, right up where those other forms were, click on the form 46. Give it a nickname, just like everything else. Put in your contact info. What's great about this, when you get farther into the form, it automatically lists for you all of the service requests that you had put in, everything you had listed in your 471, saying here's all the services we're getting. And then it just says, do you want these? You add, you select them and add them and say, just saying yes. You're adding them to the 486. You can't miss, them out, miss out on them. There's a button to click all of them. In this case, I had four. You, it'll automatically select all four of them and pop them down to the bottom, or you can pick and choose for some reason if you wanted to and add them individually. You don't have to enter any of this information, which I think is awesome. Previously, we had to look in the actual funding commitment decision and make sure we copied it all in correctly. Now it's all automatically there for us. You can't forget or miss one of them because it shows them all to you automatically. Something else to notice on the 486 to be aware of is the certifications. It is different from the 470 and the 471. Both of those, you just check all the boxes and say, yeah, I agree to all the rules and regulations. For this one, you do have to be specific about the SIPA um, certifications. Um, everybody checks early filing, which is a misnomer. It just means, yes, my service is starting at the beginning of the funding year. You only choose the waiver if you are in the middle of working on complying with the SIPA, the um, certification, the SIPA rules, which is the 
um, filtering. They give you up to three years. They give you three years to become in compliance. It can take some time to figure out what you're going to do and, and do it all. So this is just I'm in I'm in the middle of sort of, of doing that. However, if you're not in the middle and you've already been doing filtering for a while and you're already in compliance, do not check that box. You will get held up potentially. Instead, you go on to the next screen where you certify. Um, the first one is if you need to do, this is the old, if you need to do a technology plan, you check that, but it's not applying for any, it doesn't apply to any future ones. But at the bottom here, you choose the, you have to choose the correct SIPA certification. The first one is that I have um, complied with everything. Second one is I'm in the middle of, of working on it. And the third one is it doesn't apply because I'm only applying for phone. So you've got to make sure you pick the correct one here. So that's something that I just bring to your attention to pay attention to when it comes to the 46. You have 120 days um, after the funding commitment decision letter or service start date, whichever is latest to do this. Um, I do pay attention to what you're doing. I look at um, spreadsheets and pull up information to make sure that um, I know everyone's on track for um, doing all their forms. So I will reach out to you. Some of you I know have gotten emails from me in the last month or so saying, hey, this is due. You haven't done it yet. That's what I'm here for. I'll make sure that you um, get these things in in case you've missed and try and make sure you don't miss any deadlines. Once you do the 46, you'll get um, notified that it has been done just like all the other ones. It goes into your news item. See the repetition here, <laughs> um, letting you know that it's been done. So that's the first three forms in this in the in the, in the um, pro process. The rest of the forms are um, it depends on if you do them or not, and they have to do with how you want to get your funding, how you want to actually get your money. So the rest of the forms and process are invoicing forms is what they're called. 472 and 474 are the two basic forms that they talk about. They use the term invoicing for. Um, you have a choice. You can either pay all your bills in full and get reimbursed afterwards, or you can automatically have your service provider discount all your bills as you go throughout the year and you don't have to do anything afterwards. The reimbursement form is called the BEAR form. You may have heard that. That's one that libraries apply, submit. Um, the service provider form is called the SPY form, service provider invoice. If you're doing discounts, you as the library, as the applicant, submit the BEAR form if you're doing the reimbursements after the fact. If you're doing discounts of your bills throughout the year, your service provider submits the form themselves. They give you a discount on your bill, then they ask E-Rate for the refund back of what they discounted you. If you're doing those discounts, we really encourage that as your choice because at this point, you're done doing forms. The 46 was your last form you had to do for the year. The service provider submits their form, then now it's between them and E-Rate to get the money and you're automatically given a discount. If you do have to do the bare form, however, if for some reason your provider won't do it or you're doing services like um, some of those Category 2 services that you have to wait to see if you pay for them and you've got to be reimbursed, that's when you'd get into doing the bare form yourself. <clears throat> and this is where things have changed with payments, and it's a good thing. Previously, for bare payments, the money still filtered through your provider. You submitted the bare form to E-Rate. Then your provider was told, okay, give them the discount, the, right, cut them a check for the money. That became a problem for some libraries. Some providers didn't understand why they had to pass on costs or weren't, it wasn't you know, working out correctly. They decided to go direct to you. Now, if you're going to do a reimbursement after the fact, you're going to get a direct deposit into the library's bank account or whichever bank account the library's money is handled through. If it's a city account, the library has its own account, whatever. There's no longer any checks being filtered through the service provider. In order to provide this information to USAC, though, you do have to give them your banking information. This is a one-time form. You only have to submit this form once to give them the banking info. info. You do not have to do the 498 to do the, provide the banking info every year unless the banking and the information changes. Um, has your basic information, um, account number, contact person, uh, account number, routing number, all the usual stuff that you do for a direct deposit. You will need to also put in the federal ID number. Uh, that's something used for payroll. You may know it if your city clerk knows it, whoever handles that would have that information. 
This also might be a, a point, as I mentioned earlier, of giving someone else access to your Epic account to enter this information. I know we've had some city clerks that were a little hesitant about it. Let them do it themselves with their own account, not a problem. Another new number you have to have is this Dun and Bradstreet number. It's another number about giving business, uh, doing business, something the FCC is requiring. You can look up and see if you have one, and if not, you can um, uh, apply to get one. It's free to any but libraries who are doing it for this purpose with E-Rate, and same as um, some of the FCC numbers you're looking for, you ask for it, they send you it quickly in an email, boom, you enter it into your um, form. It's a little you know, confusing that there's all these new numbers you have to know, but um, luckily all of them are really easy to get and have assigned to you um, as part of this process, and you only gotta do it once. So to get to your 498, it is different. It's not one of the three main forms, 470, 71, and 486. You click on the name of your library over here underneath the logo on your landing page. And then on the left, there's a related actions option. And then way down on the bottom of the list there's, of this, there's create the year 498. Just like a lot of the other forms, enter a nickname for it, go through all the steps. I don't have screenshots of this because I didn't want to you know, show you the Library Commission's banking info, but you'd go through the process of entering all the information in here. Now, just like any other way of doing um, direct deposit, you not only have to submit the form with the info, but you have to give some sort of a documentation. Usually, when you've, I've done, you've done it personally, a copy of a voided check. Um, they will, in response to you doing that 498, you'll get an email saying, we need um, documentation, either a voided check or a statement from your bank or a letter from your, your city clerk saying, yes, this is the bank account. All of that is um, available. There's a link to click on. It's a separate thing outside of Epic. It's its own little system. There's a 498 ID number you'll enter, and you'll provide them with that um, documentation. Like I said, the 498 is a one-time deal. Submit that in there, and then that will be good for all of your future bear-related needs of getting reimbursements. The bear is the one form. I told you there was one form that didn't make it into Epic because it's it's out there. It wasn't ready yet. That's the one that you have to go to a different place to get to your bear. On the main e, uh, USAC website, the second link underneath the link to get into the Epic system is says forms. And this is a list of all the different forms and user guides and info about them. But the 472, the bear, this is where you go to apply for that one. And it's just got a different login screen. This is the one place you do still need that PIN number, that old PIN you always use to sign off on things. If you're new to E-Rate and don't have one or can't remember what it is because you heard you had to, you didn't need it anymore, you got rid of it, that's okay. You call E-Rate's 800 number and they will um, issue you one that you can use to um, do your bear form. Um, just like anything else, you get a notification, let your bears be done, an email, um, and something in your um, Epic account. Once the, the, the um, deposit has been made to your bank account, you'll get a report actually detailing all of that information. And this is the one that I got this most recent year for the Library Commission. It's a remittance statement, comes from customer support at USAC, and it lists, this is the top of it, but here's the second page, the, the beneath there, all the amounts that have been deposited into your bank account. This is where you then take this and compare it, talk to whoever your business person is, whoever your money person is, your city clerk, make sure that you do see these in um, these deposits, the direct deposits have gone into your bank account. If you're doing the discounts on your bills from your service provider and they've agreed to do that, check your bills to make sure you're seeing the discounts come on, on your bills automatically. So it's going to depend on how you're getting, you've chosen to get your funding, um, where you're going to double check to make sure you're seeing all that. Now for all of these things, for the bear one, you get a discount, you get it reimbursed afterwards for the, for the um, getting your discounts on your bills. You may get your funding commitment decision letter after the funding year has started. You know, the funding year starts in July, but, some of you have received it, You'll, the letters may not come until August, September, October, November. You will get your funding going back to the beginning of the funding year. You'll just get a big credit from the provider making up those extra months and then picking up where, it, where, you, where they uh, left off. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, and so once you've done this last part, the funding, the invoicing part, um, 
that's the end of the process for the year. Um, so we've gotten through all of it. Now you'll notice in the timing of this, when I was talking about funding years and when you can start things, you will be crossing over years. So that's something else to be aware of as well. For example, right now libraries are finishing up 2016 and doing this invoicing stuff and getting their deposits done at the same time as starting a 470, a new form for the upcoming 2017 year. So that's something just to be aware of about what funding year you're working on. You'll notice when you're in the system, there's always funding year and you'll be able to tr you know, hopefully keep track of it, but there will be overlap. There's not a E-rate year for this time starts and ends and then I start the new one. There's going to be overlapping in them. Um, Oh, someone just asked about a copy of the slides. Oh, I did email you guys a copy of the slides before the show. If you didn't get that, um, I'm sorry, but it will also be posted onto the website on when I post up the recording afterwards. So you'll have access to it um, that way as well that you can download. But you should look. Um, yeah, you, Mike, you were on the list of my people who had signed up. So you should have an email from just earlier today that has a PDF um, attachment to it. Um, if you guys don't have that, the ones of you who were pre-registered, it'll be also on the website afterwards the with the recording. All right. Um, so that's the um, whole process. Anybody have any questions right now? We're right at the end of our time that I had allotted for this. We've got about five minutes of five to seven minutes officially of, of the time left. Um, anybody have any other questions you want to ask me about... Um, Oh, there's good. Oh, okay. Here's a good one. Does SIPA does um, need to be renewed each year? Um, no, you. Um, as far as, well, what do you mean by renewed? Every year when you submit your forms, you'll always have to certify that you're still in compliance. Um, as far as the documentation for it, you, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by renewed. Every every year when you do your forms, you always have to certify um, the public notice and meeting, that only has to be done once in the lifetime of your library. You just have to make a record that you did it. But as long as you're applying for internet, you do have to be in compliance. And the, the way you tell USAC that is just checking the correct boxes in your certifications. Does that answer your question? And does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap things up? Cool. All right. That does answer it. Awesome. I just have a last few uh, helpful slides to, to put in, to go through. If you have any questions, type in your questions section. Let me know. I'll answer them. So um, I mentioned that um, USAC has a customer service department. They call it their client service bureau, 800 number, and they have an online form if you want to use that to contact them. Uh, this will be for various things you may need to ask them specifically for. I would recommend contact me first before you go to them for certain things. There's certain things they only can do, like issuing you a new PIN number, um, getting a, a new app, a new user set up in the system. But for basic, how do I do this form and what is this letter from PIA review mean or did I get this form done? <laughs> Am I on track? Um, contact me first. I can reach out. I can get all that taken care of for you. That's my job here to do that. They are working with helping, as I said, 50,000 different applications out there. So they sometimes can be a little bogged down and, and not get to things as as, as easily. Um, so um, contact me first. If I can't help you, then I would pass you on to them for, sure, for um, some you know basic things like that. Um, as you may have remembered, I showed you in the news, um, they, the Schools and Libraries Division, USAC, does a weekly news brief. Uh, it's a uh, weekly newsletter letter you can have emailed to you, or you can just look at it in your news item or on their um, news section of your um, account or on their website. Really good basic info, uh, updates about what's coming up, deadlines, uh, sometimes little news articles about how to do something that you might not know. Definitely something good to look at. Application process, this is a link to where there's a nice uh, flow chart on their website to show you what steps follow. And then there's a link to my E-Rate website um, at the Library Commission here where I have help um, information for every for um, you guys. I'll have links to this recording will be there, uh, links to all the different information about the forms, uh, all these long URLs that I've had in here, like for the Department of Education numbers and the eligible services list and anything. I've got all linked off of there as well. 
these are a couple of companies that are out there. They do, they're like those consultants that you can pay to do E-rate for you, but that's not why I put them in here. They also have a lot of good basic information on their websites, um, instructions and help and webinars um, that are free for anyone just to look at and read and access. Uh, lots of times when I'm asked of things, I end up on their sites looking for some answers as well. So um, check them out maybe if you want to see if they have any other information that might be useful to you. And there's my contact information, uh, 800 number here at the Library Commission, and my email address and our website. Um, you'll notice that my name, um, this is a tip just for this year, is got parentheses and things are kind of a mishmash. I just got married in September, and I'm in the process of changing my last name. So I'm still email address krista.burns at nebraska.gov at the moment. Um, I'm in the process of changing to Porter officially legally. I don't know when that'll come through, but um, just so you know, eventually this will be changed and you'll see here, you'll be hearing from Krista Porter instead of Krista Burns about these things. But I'm in a transition period, so that's why both names are all on there at the moment. So that is actually the uh, last slide I got here at the end. I'm pretty much right on time at 4 o'clock is when I wanted to end. Um, does anybody have any final questions, anything else you uh, need to ask of me while um, we're still here live? Type into your question section and I can answer it. No? All right. If you don't have anything urgent, that's okay right now. Um, when you get into do your for doing your forms, call me, email me, get that 470 done. No reason to wait. S start it tomorrow when you get into work. And when you start getting weird questions and things from USAC and you have no clue what they're talking about, call me. That's what I'm here for. I'm, I work with this stuff every day. You guys only work with it a few times a year, but I'm working with it every day. And like I said, I can be your translator for anything that they're, they're throwing at you. All right. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. It is has been recorded, and I will get that um, information link out to you. i got to do some processing of it. Probably not until next week sometime. It'll be all done and finished up, but I'll let you all know when it's up there. Um, and if and that the, as I said, the um, PowerPoint slides will be available as well on there. Um, if any of you did not get the emailed one that I sent earlier today, let me know, and I can send that to you again ahead of time if you want it sooner than when I get it posted next week. All right, thank you very much everyone for attending and have a good um, afternoon.